Wake up. It's time for Primal Scream. All right, we're back. Sweet. It is uh, October 5th. <laughs> I got the date this time. <laughs> October 5th. It'll be posted on the twenty fifth. Fuck, so it's already October. Uh, yeah, it'll be. It'll get posted on the. What'd you say? The twenty fifth? Yeah, I'm being sorry. I'm so, you do a great job. I apologize. I shouldn't. Okay, give so it takes me a few it. days to go through the editing, and it might because you work your ass off. Yeah, here, and yeah. we have this as a new Ooh, little, effect. which is awesome. Oh, God, that's kind of nice. crazy. Yeah. All right, so we're here today, tonight. Welcome to the Primal Scream. Yeah, I'm Matt. I'm Todd. I'm Rock. I'm and Keone. we have yeah, Keone. Keone. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome, man. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, uh, maybe not a lot of people know out there in the world who Keone is, but this badass is 5-0. and oh. Come on, now. You are. <laughs> you, you are. are. You're 5-0. and oh. we, I mean, I'm not lying when I say that. We don't do our homework. We, we do our homework. This is a fact. He's it, five it is that a is a fact. fact. Absolute That's a fact. fact. And he, uh, he's, he's guy ever. martial arts. He's in mixed <laughs> martial arts. He, but not only does he fight, he also has a gym. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome to have you here tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. So so you have hard drive MMA, mm-hmm. right? How many fighters are coming through your gym training and and fighting semi professionally, um, professionally? You know, it, it it just varies. There's there's people that want to get involved in the sport and they want to compete on a local level and they have high aspirations and big dreams. And then they, they rethink that after they've been into the cage a couple of times. Right. Um, so it's always changing, but you know, as a base, we, we have anywhere from 15 to 25 active competitors, amateur and professional that are, you know, really going for, you know, high, high goals and high expectations. Wow. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. And so when we fill up a room, um, of people, you know, tend to, 15, 25 people that are all working out at a really, really high intensity. It's, it's something to behold, you know, and a lot of people are intimidated to even come into that environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but the great thing about hard drive now is, you know, we're open to the public. We're teaching basic skills and basic classes for anybody. So jujitsu, jujitsu, kickboxing, boxing. Um, and then of course there's team hard drive where, you know, if you're a professional or amateur that wants to compete in the highest levels, you'd go to the, the team practice. And that's where the, the real stuff goes down. How do you balance the uh, fighting with the gym? Um, you, got like- you know, I, I've n- I haven't been competing very uh, consistently for a long time. It was um, I was competing really infrequently. I was competing just to show my guys that I knew what I was talking about. My journey in the martial arts was really a personal one, but it never was really positioned to compete. It was just to test myself and to learn to defend myself and give myself self-confidence. A lot of the things that people get into the martial arts for in the first place. And uh, what happened was I started finding people that would actually train with me over a decade ago and they wanted to fight. You know, there's four or five guys in the basement and they went, I want to see if I'm any good. And we were, you know, we kind of undervalued ourselves or underrated ourselves because we came out of a basement and we had no teachers, but um, we competed really, really aggressively. You know, we were undefeated for a long, long time as a team. So it's, it's been a really interesting journey. That's an awesome story. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, just coming out of the basement. Oh, fuck yeah. That's great. It's like one of those Hollywood movie kind of deals. <laughs> I like it. It's well, sweet. in people, when it comes to mixed martial arts, there's this uh, conception that these guys train in these big gyms or these old old school boxing gyms. When mixed martial arts first started, there wasn't a lot of places to train. There were a few of those big gyms across the country, but there was basically a lot of people getting together and training. So I would go over to my buddy Dave Scherzer, who's the co- the the what I call the co-founder because he – he founded Hard Drive and I had my own team hybrid and we kind of came together. But I'd go over to Dave's house and we'd be training in a garage on two layers of carpet padding and carpet. And there was like a bag and an Airdyne bike. <laughs> and it was just sprints for like half an hour and then beat the hell out of each other. Just beat each other's asses. Like 100 degrees out, people slobbering all over each other. It was you know, it, it, people have no idea what mixed martial arts had to really evolve and go through to become what you see today. It's been a hell of a ride, that's for sure. And I'll say, you guys put a lot of work <clears throat> in making those basements workout friendly. Yeah. You know, the the walls were matted, floors were matted, you yeah. had bags hanging and everything. 
It was pretty cool to see how you utilize that space. Yeah, we took it seriously. But you know what's what's really cool is before that, we didn't. We had mats on the floor in a cement wall in a basement. So when you would clinch up with somebody on the wall and they would base out and drop their hips, it was like a cheese grater on your hands yeah. behind these guys' Shit. backs. Oh. There were exposed electrical outlets and people getting cut on. I mean, it was crazy shit that was going on there. But before even that, we were training in chicken coops and in living rooms. And you guys, you wouldn't believe some of the stories that I'd tell you. Well, it only makes sense if you got enough, if you have nowhere to go, you're right. going to have to make do with what you have. Yeah. yeah. I was going to tell you, um, Kenny, is that I met when Rock and I started uh, working together. I uh, play tennis a lot. The opposite of MMA, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I and I I met uh, was it Andre the Bull? Oh yeah, the Bull. And Andre so Case. I'm playing tennis with this dude who is just enormous tattoos, you know, and I, I like him right away. He's a pretty cool guy, and he and I are playing tennis, and and he's like, ah, I ride my bike everywhere, and uh, I'm training at this at this gym down the street, and I'm like, awesome. So then I came to you knowing just base information, and I said. You know the guy named Andre? Rock right away. Oh, yeah, I know Andre. We know Dre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, and I know we're, we're, I haven't seen him for a long time. Is he, I mean, do you have people in and out of the gym? Like, he's yeah. obviously on your website as a fighter for yeah. your guys' group. Does I'm, it happen like that quite a bit? You know, sometimes Andre trained, has been training with hard drive for a long, long time. He's had a long career. Yeah. And he, his career, for the most part, is over. Now he's just training for fun. Um, he, he actually took a, a pretty decent job up in Waterloo. And so he's training with those guys, um, up in Waterloo and kind of helping out and coaching there for the first time, which is cool. He's got to, you know, return some of that knowledge to, to other kids Awesome for mixed martial arts. But Andre's always coming back to Cedar Rapids. When he does, he always drops in and trains with us. And he's, he's been with us for so long. He just is always going to be welcome in that gym. You know what I mean? He's put, he's put out a lot and he's really proud of hard drive and he's really, tried to help push hard drive to become what it is now today. So yeah, whenever he's in town, I love having him in the gym. That's awesome. He's a real personality. Yeah. He's you know, a when, you're, when you're talking about training and, um, or where you're working out at in the basements and chicken coops. And I mean, that stuff is hard. No mm. doubt about it. Finding a place to be able to do that stuff. But, um, <laughs> understand. <laughs> what? Well, we'll yeah, yeah, it was don't nice. Worry, don't worry about it. <clears throat> but, uh, there, there's, uh, you can't, it's really hard to go out and find people that are great at jujitsu. Right. I mean, this is Iowa. You find tons of people who are great at wrestling. Mm -hmm. That's easy to find somebody who's really good at that. But when when Hoist Gracie came in mm. to the UFC and started just wrecking people, and 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 there were no weight classes back in the day, and you were watching this little dude. Well, he's not that little, but compared to some of the people sure. he was yeah. fighting, it was like David and Goliath, and he was just wrecking these humongous guys. So. When he started showing that to the world, mm -hmm. jujitsu had to be part of your, it had to be in your tool belt. Right. Well, you know, it, when, if I go back to the beginning of my martial arts experience, it's uh, movies. You know, it's Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Steven Seagal, shamefully. Not a Seagal fan anymore. <laughs> His um, first stuff is awesome, though. Yeah, but, Br but Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee really was, oh, yeah. Bruce Lee was the guy that, that pushed me into martial arts. Isn't he kind of, I kind of look at him as the... Or the, father of mixed martial of arts. Of mixed martial arts yeah. with his Jeet Kune Do and That's, saying that you can't have physical the, forms. The definition of Jeet Kune Do, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, it's adapting to anything that happens. Right. Isn't that yeah. kind of the way the it theory, works? Yeah, the theory. the theory. And there were people that, you know, back in the day, there were people that practiced the theory. And then there were people that tried to make Jeet Kune Do its own, you know, Form. kind of cookie cutter martial art. Mm -hmm. And that was completely against Bruce's theory in the entire book. So I don't understand these people that are like, oh, Jeet Kune Do is definitely this way of block. And it's like, no, that's... You obviously didn't pick up the big deal in, in, in that book, but um, I had already bought into that theory and I only had Taekwondo available to me here in Cedar Rapids. So I went to the local public library and got all the martial arts books that I possibly could, studied all the martial arts that I could. And at this time I was a teenager, you know, I didn't really have anything. My brother, Eric, uh, was a Taekwondo guy, a Taekwondo kid, I guess I should say, but very talented. But that was the only martial art option and I wasn't really bought into that. And so after I had read uh, Bruce's book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, and the rest of them, I happened upon the UFC and a video cassette in Blockbuster Video, a VHS. And I thought it was a movie at first, and you know, I was a martial arts buff, and I said, oh, this is cool. And then I read the, the back, and I was just like, oh, this is the 
coolest thing <laughs> ever. You know what I mean? This is legit. Right. This is going to show me what a, the best martial art was. And I was thinking I was going to see some Kung Fu master tear somebody's head mm-hmm. off or something like that. And it was this little, little skinny Brazilian guy. You know? right. And I was like, oh, okay. Bruce had some jujitsu in his book, but I had no idea that it was so important until that, that day. Because what they say, like 80 to 90% of all fights, whether it's professional or if you're out in the street and you get into a brawl, it's going to go to the ground. Yep. Yeah. Especially the ones that are going in, in the streets because nobody has any kind of takedown defense. And, and, you know, people wrestle, they panic, they grab each other. They usually end up on the ground at some point. That shit sounds scary. Uh, have I'll you, stick with tennis, <laughs> the yellow balls and the racket. Have you ever seen the uh, on YouTube Gracie in action? Have you seen? Oh, you yeah. Typed in Gracie in action. Yeah. And then they go back to the black and white films. Yeah. The the in in jujitsu studio challenge matches and valet tudo matches. That's and, so cool because yeah. it to me for the first time I'm seeing that really the UFC that type of mentality has been around for so long. Sure. It's been around for so long. And it amazes me that it's just now to this day and age so worldly accepted, worldwide mm-hmm. accepted that jujitsu is so important to that. Yeah. Well, and, and and as is wrestling, you know, people under almost underrate wrestling and go, oh, wrestling is just the sport that, you know, the Midwest is really good at. No, wrestling is a martial art. It's one of the oldest martial arts that is known to man. If you go back to the the first Olympic Games, you see wrestling. That's what it was. Didn't they do that naked too? Um, they did it naked, which is. Imp- Are you trying to make this exciting for yeah, our people the, in San Francisco? We should bring that back. <laughs> you know what? You know what? They, it was naked, but at the time, you could also tear people's fingers off, bite each other, and a lot of times, people died. Yeah, they, they were onto something back then. Yeah, so they were they were a little bit a little bit more intense than we are. Even I dig the fact that you have. Uh, this was a few years ago, but I started thinking, you know, I want to get my kids. I have three kids, mm-hmm. young kids. I want to get them into martial arts. I want them to start learning a discipline. One, because I have a little girl and I want her to be able to protect herself in today's day and age. When she gets older, I mean, if she keeps if she keeps training, by the time she gets old enough and she is dating when she's 30. Um, <laughs> get her concealed carry license. Yeah, they, yeah. Go. Oh Christ, do we have to go that direction? Yeah, why already? not? Jesus, let's just keep it on MMA. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get there. <laughs> but yeah, being able to protect yourself, roll with somebody. If somebody grabs her and takes her to the ground, which hey, rape is not going to be happening when someone's holding her in the air, right? Uh, well, it's, you know, with with self defense and things like that, I I've have a, a story to relate. When I had opened this gym, I had a college student or somebody that was going to college, beautiful young woman, um, high school senior mom came in with her and said, Hey, I want her to learn how to defend herself. Cause she's going to college. And I said, okay, we can do that. But what, what we need to do about this first is be logical and understand she's about a hundred pounds. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And what's more important than teaching her how to high kick and low kick and do throw on an arm bar is understanding <laughs> that a 280-pound lineman, when you're cornered in a room, you're not going to do shit against him. Even even a 180-pound guy. Right. When you're, right. right. You're, you're hosed. Yeah. You know, there's no special technique that I'm going to teach you that's going to keep you safe. What's going to keep you safe is logic and common sense and good decision making. And I told her mom that, and I said, you can pay. And I will definitely train her and I'll train her and teach her the best way that I can to defend herself. But some of that's going to be not putting herself in certain situations because size matters. That's just all there is to it. And by training, actually being put in situations where she knows what her limits are. Right. Is actually a pretty big awakening. Right. You know, and it's a good way for somebody to see what their limits are and what their potential is and what they, you know, what they can achieve. But if anything, it gives you the confidence to look at somebody in the eye and go, I'm not a victim. So if you pick me, you're going to at least have a fight to deal with, you know, and that will most violent criminals or criminals in general are going to are going to pick easy targets. They're not going to pick a woman that stares them right in the eye because she knows that woman is evil, more evil than most <laughs> women. Because <laughs> when I think of cause, uh, things are changing a lot. You see like Ronda Rousey mm-hmm. out there and I know she's an Olympic Judo, uh, judo. Yeah. I mean, shit. Her mom won the gold, right? In did she? I didn't even know that. Wait, or did Ron, I, I think her mom was the first one who got into the Olympics. I think Ronda's the first one who won a medal. Yeah, Ronda. Ronda's, okay. Ronda's, Ronda. Ronda's the gold medalist. I'm, I'm pretty. <clears> but sure. I mean, she had she had her mom, you know, backing her play the whole time. Mm. So she's kind of like Wonder Woman compared to the normal ladies. But female mixed martial artists, 
that's starting to become a more much more popular there's, yeah. accepted thing. Yeah, there's a whole new crop of female mixed martial artists, and Rousey's the most publicized, but she's definitely not. You know, there's not. She's not the only one. There's a lot of really talented women out there that would beat the living dog shit out of ninety percent of the men on the planet. I find it crazy. Not to digress or anything, but Ronda Rousey's like what eight no. Yeah, all first round armbar submissions. Yeah. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that's crazy. Why can't anybody stop her armbar? Why can't anybody <laughs> stop Ben Askren's uh, ground? Yeah, and good point. Nah. <laughs> if you if you got something figured out and that's yeah. all you got figured out and you got it 100 percent figured out, it's hard to stop. Stick huh? with it. Yeah, why, sure. why would? You? Well, and I think the idea too that she and Dana White, I'm sure, said, "Hey, I'm the hottest. You know, I have this one move that's." undefendable at this point why She's not use it as a marketing Mar- she, I mean market the shit well, out of it if that brings more women into the sport I don't, I don't think you- she chooses I don't I don't think she goes into a fight going I'm gay it's not arm bar I think it's one of those she things might. where it's so it's so ingrained that when the opportunity is there and it falls into place and it but she fishes itself, but you watch it. when, she she, when she throws that arm bar. Yeah, she knows she's going to finish it. She's, I mean, she throws it in hard and she, she, throws, it she throws it in hard and fast. And she throws it in from <clears throat> positions you normally don't see arm bars being attempted yeah. attempted from. She she's, goes for it hard. She intentionally goes for it from awkward situation, but she gets it, you know, yeah, right. which is pretty awesome. But like John Jones the other day, oh, he was a great fight. He was taken down for the first time yeah. ever, mm-hmm. you know, in the UFC. So, I mean, to have him be. If I'm him and I get taken down and normally no one takes me down and now I don't have to worry about it, to be taken down for the first time, you get off your game. I mean, you have sure. a strategy, you have this game plan, right, yep. until you get hit for mm-hmm. the first time and then it changes. Yeah, he got beat up pretty bad in that fight too. And I think – I, I mean, mean, they had to help Gustav him out of the won. damn yeah. right. I think Gustav someone. But yeah. uh, regarding that fight, you know, that it, that is true. You get thrown off and it, people always go in with some kind of game plan in a fight. But you're talking about a fight. You know what I mean? The the conditions that you're in change in nanoseconds. And if you make if you blink, you could blink and then wake up and go, What's going on? Where am I at? What happened? And Yeah, everything was going according to plan yeah. until I just woke up. What the hell? <laughs> you, you could be dominant you can be dominating a fight and completely beating the dog shit out of a guy and he throws a Hail Mary punch and it sneaks through and lasers through your arms and then you're waking up and you don't know what happened. You know, it happens all the time. Right. As I'm getting more knowledgeable about MMA, <clears throat> I thought I was really curious to hear a conversation about guys talk about how you know how small those gloves are and if even if you have a good defense. It's so much harder because you don't have those big gloves to kind of block and, and get in the way. And that even people can, like you said, sneak things in. And I, I this is just me. And I, it, it's like guys who are, that are built for the military. I, I just know that I'm not, I'm not one of those people. It's like these MMA guys. I just think they're badasses and I admire them so much. I just, you're talking about being in a fight, right? I honestly think that I don't, ha- I don't think I've ever really been in like a knockdown drag out fight, even as a bouncer. I don't think I ever did that. And now listening to all these podcasts and MMA stuff, I'm like, I think I'm good. Never having that happen. <laughs> well, like you said, getting popped by somebody, it changes your whole, I mean, it changes everything. Yeah. And I just, it sounds scary. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that if you were to continually get hit in training, I'm assuming, cause I haven't, I've been in a couple of boxing smokers at, at Fort Bragg and we did training for a few months before that. But the more things happen to you and the more you're getting hit in training and stuff, I'm sure you get accustomed to it. But uh, how do you guys how do you guys deal with when I got knocked out? It was just when I got hit really hard. It was all of a sudden I went from tunnel vision to pinpoints. I'm seeing nothing yeah. but pinpoints. How do you guys work through that? Well, we we don't we don't really always take it to that level. You know, a lot of mixed martial arts. It's so diverse in terms of range. You have to work a lot of skill. You know, and you can't spar. A lot of these boxers that go in there and they start as amateur boxers and they they go pro and three years later they can't talk the same and. You yeah. know, th- this is a real issue. I like to be a little bit smarter than that now. We've been in some big, long. It's funny because I actually, it's ironic. I just got a concussion the other day sparring, um, and it's maybe the third one I've had in my life. Because usually my big focus is on defense. You know, if you're getting hit, ultimately your defense is lacking, right, and needs to get better. Whether it's in boxing or or, or martial arts or whatever, so I try to make my defense so good I don't take a lot of punches even when we are sparring hard. But we limit the hard sparring we do now because, you know, when we're done doing this, we need to be able to do something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? That shit adds up, huh? It, it does. Yeah. It does. And, like, I, it's weird because I've, I've seen a lot of studies and a lot of, a lot of uh, things lately on, um, you know, post-traumatic syndrome from concussions. And, you know, we're seeing this now in the NFL. 
Junior Seau just committed suicide in the, you know. I'm no pretty, shit. Yeah, you didn't hear about no. that? Yeah, like a, a year ago. He killed himself. Oh, I'll yeah. be damned. Yeah, and they found out he was suffering from <laughs> severe depression. Yeah. And a lot of this depression is related to this, these, you know, successive concussions and mm-hmm. in, in injuries. These guys are like 300 pounds running around on the football field now smashing. God, right. Yeah. And when you're, so seeing those, you're seeing those injuries in college football players now too. Yeah, in, in boxing and in football, people want to talk about how crazy, you know, mixed martial arts is. In, in mixed martial arts, we, we don't spar hard all the time. Some gyms do. I don't advocate for it because I want people to be able to, you know, wear shoelaces and not Velcro when they get older. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, the boxing in football, you're going to, you're going to take brain damage and you're seeing that a lot in the NFL. I think the NFL uh, players union just won a huge lawsuit for like a billion dollars. from the and, NFL. and it wasn't as much as they thought either, because the prosecutor, I think I've probably said this before in the podcast, the prosecutor for the players said there were guys who had been in the NFL for three or four years who were getting money from this deal. And he's like, that's three or four years of the NFL. That's not co- counting Pop Warner, you know, Metro football in the Cedar Rapids area. It's, you know, right. college, it high school. It's, it's, right. it's everything accumulated. Yeah. It's not just the NFL. Right. You know, which again, like I've said before, I've chosen not to let my kids play football, even though I played football in college. My brother plays football in college. I just am not going to take that chance. And I'd much rather learn how to do something like this that, you know, the sustainability is a little bit. More uh, yeah. regulated. My, I was a buddy of mine, and I carpool to work every day. And the other day, I had made the comment that, you know, how's your how's your son doing in football? He's like, oh, really, really pretty good. And then he turned to me and he said, uh, "Are you are you still pretty hardcore about not letting your kids play football?" I said, "Dude, just you know, let let's set aside the the head injury type thing. You know, later on in years. But when I was playing football, I had my knee taken out. Yeah." And yeah, your true. knees don't heal. That's just, I mean your cartilage. They're never is the fucked. same. It's fucked. Period. He's like, oh yeah, I guess uh, I guess <clears> that, that that's pretty serious. I I understand where you're coming from. Or my kid's best friend just tackled his classmate in practice and destroyed his knee. Yep. Just 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 obliterated Gosh. the knee. That's and I'm like, and that's exactly why my kids are not going to play football. Yeah, tennis and swimming and soccer, then they all have their possible injuries and twisted ankles and all that stuff. But the likelihood. Would you let them do MMA? I like MMA because it teaches you how to. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into MMA. Yeah. It's Def- kind of, defending it's, is one of the first things you learn, isn't sure. it? How to defend yourself correctly. Defending and footwork, but, you know. Kind of what I was going into before. People think about MMA and they think that there's this gym going on and in it there's people beating the shit out of each other all day long. And when you walk in, they're going to look at you like fresh meat that's going to get <laughs> tenderized, you know. Yeah. They, they have some real big preconceived notions about it. And what they find is a bunch of athletes in a gym or a bunch of normal people in a gym um, hitting bags, hitting mitts, hitting double end bags, hitting speed bags doing weight routines, plyometrics, you know, pull-ups. Every once in a while, people spar. You know what I mean? The people at the high level spar. You're not, you're not spending a lot of your time taking huge amounts of trauma. You break down logically what football is. And I love watching the good football game. Yeah. Love it. Right. But what football is, is um, one group of people and another group of people smashing themselves into each other repeatedly, sometimes head first, in piles where limbs are probably going to get twisted up. In all of the time that I've been in mixed martial arts, the worst injury I had was a minor shoulder, shoulder separation in a broken hand in competition just this last time. That's it. You know, that's pretty good. Outside of a couple concussions, if I would have been playing football this whole time, I would be fucked up, I promise you. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So what do you prefer, a uh, stand-up game or a ground game for yourself Gra- personally? A uh, ground game. Uh, I like the idea that I can take somebody to the ground, force them into a position that they can't help themselves and render them unconscious, break their arm without beating the dog shit out of somebody or having the potential. Because when you're in a striking match, you know, and you're going up against a good striker, sometimes a good striker is used to training a certain way and a crazy wild attacker can catch him. It happens from some, you know, from time to time. You don't really see that with the jujitsu game. If you have a jujitsu master, the only person that's really going to give him a trouble in trouble in anything is a jujitsu master. That's just the way it is. And I will say too, from or, personal or experience. somebody who doesn't allow their that to go to the ground. Right. If you can stop the takedown and you, right. and you, 
repeatedly, like uh, Iceman, Chuck Liddell. He was mm-hmm. great at stuffing the takedown because he was su- he had such heavy hands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was so good on his feet and he had such a solid chin. He wouldn't let people take him to the ground. So all these people that had great jujitsu. Yeah, and he had a good wrestling base, too. Yeah. He wasn't a bad wrestler. A lot of people don't know that about Chuck Liddell. He actually was a great wrestler before he, you know, and he did karate, Koyushkin karate. But, um, you know, he a lot of people didn't want to stand with him, so they tried to take him down and find out he had a good base, and then he just beat him up. Then then he'd be mentally in their head. But, um, yeah, I like jiu-jitsu personally because I'll be ju- doing jiu-jitsu for the rest of my life. It's low impact. When you get really good at it, you're not really doing any big, explosive, dangerous situations. It's a great fucking workout. It's, it's a great man. workout. Yeah. It's real smooth, and it's real. There's not. It's not traumatic. You know, with striking, even holding mitts, the the impact of that over time, the thousands of repetitions, the thousands of um, impacts your knuckles have on a bag or on a surface, it's it takes its toll, just like jogging does and running. You know, high impact running, but jujitsu is really smooth, really liquid. And uh, a lot more gentle. You know, I don't have to knock somebody unconscious or give them brain damage. That's not my goal. My goal is to put them to sleep and walk away. Because four out of your five fights have been submission. Submission, yeah. yeah. Chokes. Yeah. And that, it doesn't really, that's not really <laughs> accurate because a lot of people, oh, well, it's just chokes. There have been a couple guys I'd beat the shit out of before I choked them out. Like the first guy that I fought, I'd elbowed him something like 70 times. Oh, it was terrible. And, um, Freaking he, terrible. And he, he didn't cut. He he truly had thick skin and he was okay, um, but I, I just beat him up until he gave me his back and I choked him out. So, jujitsu is jujitsu and kickboxing is kickboxing, but MMA truly is something completely different. You can have a jujitsu guy um, go out there with a black belt and get hit in the face two three times and he doesn't know where he's at and he's starting to make bad decisions. So he's not thinking like a black belt anymore. He's thinking like a blue belt or a survival. Belt. And there's a saying there's a saying uh, in martial arts that every time you get hit. You, you lose a belt level in your jiu-jitsu game because you get a little bit farther behind and farther behind. So even Hoyce Gracie himself said that the only thing that a belt covers is the two inches above your ass. Yeah. And the rest <laughs> is up to you. You know what made me really sad about him? When, when he came back and fought Matt Hughes. <clears throat> yeah. And Matt Hughes just obliterated him. It yeah. just made me so sad because he's such a legend. You know, you have that guy on such a pedestal to have him come in and you're thinking, okay, He's awesome. The jujitsu. God, I, I, I really wanted him to take yeah. Matt Hughes down and and because of his knowledge, finish him. And, talking about and, Gracie? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, what, what am I saying? Am I saying? Yeah. Hoist Gracie. Matt oh. Hughes. Yeah. I got you. So that was kind of, that was sad for me. Well, and yeah. you know, like the UFC was almost dead in the water. MMA was almost dead in the water. When we were competing, we were, you know, way back in the day in the basements and such. We were, we were driving four to eight hours sometimes to fight in barns. And I'm not kidding at all. We'd warm up in these rooms where cattle had just been recently washed. There'd be, you know, pieces of shit on the wall while we're warming up. And I'm like, this can't be sanitary, but, (laughs) but we love this. We love to fight. And so that was kind of the stuff that we, that we had to deal with. But when tough came along tough, the abbreviation of the ultimate fighter, MMA blew up and we kind of knew it was going to blow up at that time. And it kind of bummed us out because we kind of liked being on the underground scene a little bit. But um, it, it really, really blew up at that time, and it went from being blacklisted on cable networks, and John McCain said it was human cockfighting, and blah, right. blah, blah, blah. Cock, blah. right? Cock. <laughs> um, That's all I heard in that sentence. You know, it, it, it really blew up, and a lot of people didn't know who Hoist Gracie were. They knew who Matt Hughes right. were, and they, they were familiar with him, but they, a lot of those new fans weren't really connected with the old school. And when they announced that fight, I'm like, oh, man, Hughes is going to destroy him. You know, Hoist will never be able to get him down. He's too good a wrestler. You know, I didn't think Hughes was going to submit him, but you know, all the more well, impressive. It, I mean, he took his back and he just started pounding I mean, on him, pounding yeah. on him left and right. So. Yep, uh, that's going to be the only part of MMA that gets me like ah, uh, is when those guys get knocked down and they start those hammer blows and they defend for a little bit and then you can see them lose it. And somebody gets a couple good shots in. But again, that's the great thing about MMA because yeah. you have that referee right there. And when you right. can't oh, no. intelligently defend yourself, boop, it's over. Absolutely. Done. I appreciate that part too. But there's still a part of it for me. It's just like, oh, fuck. That just looks really, really horrible. Like, like, you can't remember it. Thank goodness, I guess. But. I, I like it because you can have a war like you had with the uh, Gustafson and Jones fight. Right. Mm-hmm. You can have a clean knockout where somebody just goes out and gets knocked out right away, which isn't really a bad deal. As long as you don't take a ton of punishment, you can get a quick submission. 
or you can get some really nasty, long, drawn out war. So that's that's part of the intensity of getting in the cage and fighting a guy. It's like you don't really know what you're in for. You you know what you're going to try to accomplish, but if things get bad, you got to gut up and you know potentially fight with blood in your eyes and a broken nose and. Mm. It's great. A broken hand. Last time for me, that was the first time I ever broke anything. That's right. I and mean, you won that fight too. Yeah. The yeah. broken hand. That's now, badass. besides the jujitsu, because <clears throat> MMA is so, it's not just on your feet. I mean, you, you, when people think of boxers, if, if they have any contact with anybody who's ever boxed and they're running miles and miles and people are, are fighting 12, 13 rounds, right. you know, their, their conditioning is so amazing, but when you get to MMA and you're rolling around with somebody, somebody, and you're wrestling, I mean, if you've ever been a wrestler, three two-minute rounds in high school, <laughs> exactly. I mean, people Jesus. are exhausted. I mean, yeah. to have that type of uh, conditioning, I mean, mm. jiu-jitsu is amazing. It's an amazing tool. But if you don't have the conditioning to go along with that, right. you could have you could have just some some guy who has a great defense. Well, and it, wears you out. Yeah. You can't breathe. You can't fight, right? Right. Yeah. You're winded. Yeah, and there's no energy left. There's important differences to to differentiate between these these different types of conditioning. There's definitely a wrestling shape. There's definitely boxing shape. There's jujitsu shape. They're all different types of conditioning. But at the highest level, all of these people, high level jujitsu players, high level wrestlers, high level box, they are all they're all in great shape. The interesting thing comes when you take each one of these people and you put them against each other. Now, if you put a wrestler in a boxing match, he could go at three minutes full intensity. You put him in a boxing match with a boxer and after a minute and a half, he's so exhausted. He can barely walk. That's so true. Right Mm -hmm. now you take that same wrestler and you put them in a wrestling match with a boxer and the boxer who can dance around for 12 rounds gets taken down and dominated by the wrestler. And in a minute and a half, he can't throw a punch. His arms are dead. He gets up and he's completely exhausted. So you do have different types of conditioning, and that's what makes mixed martial arts so good is you have to be so well-rounded. You need the aerobic of a kickboxer or a, a boxer, and you need the anaerobic or explosive power of a wrestler or a jiu-jitsu guy. And if you put those two together, you've got a, you know, you've got a freak athlete. And you have to have the brain power of a chess master. You yeah. Do. yeah. I mean, you really have to be able to – I mean, if you're holding on to a, a choke mm-hmm. or something and you're just straining really hard and you're in the first round – and you don't know if you're necessarily going to get him to tap, you got to realize that you you might want to change go, things yeah. up. Because if your arms are completely fagged by the end of that round, I mean, I remember wrestling and uh, having a head and arm, and I'm squeezing the hell out of somebody. And I get into the second round, and my arms are just dead. I mean, there's a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Grip strength and being able to sustain a strong grip for, for three or five rounds is so important, I think. Yeah, it is. And then also being having your calves conditioned – to to, uh, to go three to five rounds to bounce it around in a stand up war in case you have to be there because th- I tell you what that I've you know trained a little bit with you guys and if your calves aren't in shape to be bouncing around for fifteen minutes holy shit your your calves are on fire yeah you know and you can't move like if you could you, in that first minute yeah and if you, you know? can't move you you can't fight you're just gonna be yeah. getting hit you know like lot. when I was competing uh, my first three or four fights one thing I was doing every day is uh, jump rope. Yep, because that's an idea. Jump rope simulates fight movements. A lot of people think run and sprinting is really applicable for conditioning. Sprints on the bike, sprints outside, but jump rope's applicable for movement and conditioning of your your calves. And I was doing uh, five minutes, and then the next day I'd do six minutes and seven minutes, all the way up until I was roping for 30 to 40 minutes straight, just constantly. Boom, 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 boom. Really? Boom. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then what I noticed was when I got to that <laughs> point, two to three weeks before the fight, when I was sparring, I didn't even have to think about my legs. They just moved. They were good. They, they, they like literally had a mind of their own. They were synced up. And I was also running the stairs, like a hundred flights of stairs every other day. And um, then doing, you know, weight routines where I'm supporting weight and lifting weight and trying to get more powerful and explosive. It, you, you have to be really, really well-rounded. And like Rock said, you have to be able to maintain a tight hold on something for sometimes minutes at a time. And yeah, you might get that guillotine choke and, and have to think about, geez, do I let go of this and I go to something else? Or you might think, geez, if I let go of this, the guy that I'm in right now with is a monster. He might <laughs> cave my skull in with an elbow. I mean, right. I, if I, and that's the funny thing in the, in these jujitsu matches or these MMA matches that we have in the gym or in the fight, a lot of times there's this guess game, like 
do I hold on to this? Is this guy playing possum? Because when somebody gets me in a choke a lot of time, I'll fake and pretend like I'm doing just fine. All my body language will be saying, you don't have anything on me. But really inside my mind, I'm going, holy shit, I'm going to pass out because I'm not getting any air. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's poker face, Mm -hmm. poker body, basically. And so if I hang on long enough, I can get out of that choke and or, you know, maybe make them think, oh, geez, I'm never going to get this. I got to let go. Well, you know, that that may be my only hope, too. So there is a there is a very real chess match, unspoken chess match going on all the time. That's that's amazing. You know, it's really good. At it that, really is awesome. That last uh, Ben Askren fight where he went for so many different chokes, so many different submissions. But he would only hang on to him for maybe a few seconds because he knew immediately, like, oh, that's going to cost too much energy. Probably not going to get it. Yep. Let's just keep on Move. you know, peppering him with punches to the, fe- to the side of the head and stuff like that. Yep. And, th- and he said after the fight, too, that because um, they, they, of course, asked him, why didn't you put more effort into some of those submissions? And, you know, he said, hey, if it's not there, it's not there. Why waste all my energy? Why, why burn my arms out? Right. You know, exactly. so what are your thoughts on other ways of training? Obviously, you're a mixed martial arts guy. What's, what's the one that's... Kickboxing? Kasama. Zumba. Zumba. Zumba is pretty kick-ass. But Kasama, you know, CrossFit. What are your thoughts on some of these other ways of training? Um, You know what? For me, it's uh, it's all about training. It's all about getting in the gym. and Getting off the that, couch. Proving that you can, you can accomplish something and you can hit some kind of goal. If your goal is to lose weight and you do lose weight, then you're going to get some kind of confident after result of that. Who gives a shit? You know what I mean? I just think people need to understand that now that there's more of us living in the city, less of us doing production jobs, less of us farming, less of us moving and being active, we need to be more proactive and get into whatever. It doesn't matter what gym you need to get into. Get into a gym and start moving your ass and and find whatever workout works for you. But is any, you know, I think a lot of these these people get into these uh, workout wars and you see these memes on these stupid fucking memes on Facebook like CrossFit sucks, man. CrossFit guys think this, but actually I could lift a fucking ton of weight. Nobody gives a shit, dude. Honestly, you know what Osama's I mean? Osama's way better than CrossFit. Yeah. It's like, is this what you guys got? You know what I mean? You right. got sports for this shit. Why are you trying to dog on what they're yeah. doing if what they are doing works and they like it? I just don't see it. I don't see it. I right applaud thing. anybody for getting Good up off the couch and working out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care what it is. There's some <laughs> things that are obviously more effective than others, and I think the results will show. Well, and I like I like the bar lifting, it pull ups, that kind of stuff. Kettlebell workouts. That's got to be all grip kind of stuff, right? That, that definitely builds up a, a grip strength and builds up the uh, ability to sustain a good grip for a long time, like, yeah. like we were talking about earlier. Um, I've been working out intensely for a, a long time, and I'll say like the the conditioning workouts that I've seen these guys go through, because I hang around a lot of different fighters, they're by far the most intense, most terrible workouts I've ever seen people go through. Your brother, I used to work out with your brother quite a bit. I remember this one workout that uh, our mutual friend had prepared for him, and I read it, and I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Yeah, like it was a joke. He he cried. He cried afterwards. I mean, it was that fucking bad. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I watched him go through it, and I was like, I, I don't think I'm going to go through this one with you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you know, that so. that same type of workout, uh, my, my brother and a couple other people put me through before one of my fights mm-hmm. in, at Valhalla at the old gym on 5th Street. And um, you can't even verbalize what it feels like to be in a position where you can barely lift the weight, but you have just enough in a fighter's heart to get that weight up and you do it for a minute straight and then you do something else for a minute straight and then something else for a minute fight straight. Fight gone bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fight gone bad's horrible but then, shit. And I, then you have and then you have fresh opponents that have been licking their chops and waiting for you on the rope side, <laughs> jumping in and beating the fuck out of you. I hated that in wrestling practice when they would be Shark like, Oh yeah, you're out there. Yeah. All right, rotate in. Yeah. Fresh guy, fresh get in. Guy, fresh yeah. guy. So fresh guy. So yeah. I'm physically exhausted from the weights that they put me through. And then I get demoralized by having people that normally I could hang against just smacking me around, taking me down at will. People screaming at me, get up, get up, get up. And I and they know and I know that I physically have no energy to move, but I have to mentally deal with it. So I go through the whole workout, 25 minutes worth. And uh, I'm exhausted in my now ex-wife, then current wife, Tish walks in and says, what did they have you do? And I go, oh, well, they started off with you know squat thrusts and then a minute of this and a minute of this. And I started tearing up 
while I was talking about it. Had no idea why I was talking about it, but just reliving and going through my head what had just happened to me was so emotional that I just almost burst into tears. I'm like, I can't talk right now. Just give me a couple minutes and I'll tell you what the workout was all about. I needed time to process what I had just went through. And until until you get to a point like that, personally, where you have to like ask yourself, am I going to give up and just quit? Or am I going to keep trying, even though I know that I won't win? Most people never have to ask themselves that question ever in their life, in, in modern life. They, they can coast through pretty easily. We have to do that on a daily basis, you know? So it's, it's rough. Do you think that mental game is a huge part of it? It's everything. It's everything. I've beaten people in fights before the fights happen just by looking at them. You know what I mean? Just you can tell by looking at somebody in the eyes when you're weighing in with them. You know, if you smile, if somebody smiles or they got all this bravado and, oh, you know, they're all psyched up. I can tell that that's a weak minded person. And if I just look at them and they can see confidence in your eyes and they know that you're not afraid, a lot of them will shut down before they ever get into the cage. And that's fun to watch, too. You can see in the cage a lot when you have two guys staring <laughs> each other down who has the mental edge. Yeah. You can always just kind of – you can tell just by the expressions on their face how one will look right at them. The other one kind of looks the way the whole time. Yeah. One of my up-and-coming yeah. guys, uh, Jordan Sanford, he's a, just a phenom. He's 6-0, and oh, six knockouts, first round, just annihilating everybody in his path. One of the most gifted, if not the most gifted, fighter I've ever trained in my life. Um. <clears throat> He's like, we had a conversation about the psychological aspect of, you know, looking at somebody and being able to tell if there's fear in their eyes and stuff. And he's, he's a very real person and he understands that psychological part of the game like a lot of martial artists don't at, at his age. And he looked at him, he looked at his opponent in the last way in and he's like, coach, I saw it. I saw exactly what you're talking about. He broke. He's afraid of me. I can tell. He doesn't want to fight me. The next day, no shit, this actually happened. Uh, two, three weeks ago, actually. His opponent, 10 minutes before their fight, said that he couldn't close his hand because the MMA glove was too small. The promoter comes up to me and the Iowa commissioner comes up to me with the, this guy's coach who looks like Kenny Powers, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Who's awesome, by the way. He's a big, yes. scary dude. Yeah. And he goes, my fighter can't close his hand. He's not fighting. They should have double XL gloves, blah, blah, blah. I look over at this guy's hand and it's not a huge hand. It's smaller than one of my guy's hands who can fit into this glove. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck you guys think I'm supposed to do about this. My guy's ready to put, you know, glue, gauze, and glass on and go kill somebody in a kickboxing match if necessary. Lubing the deals. Lubing the deals. And, uh, <laughs> and all these it's phrases. A, it's, it's, it, we're, we're not, we're not we're, we're, out, we're outside of the we're inside outside. joke. <laughs> East, East bound it down. It. East bound it down. Oh, no, but, shit. um, so you guys aren't cool enough, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You're never welcome. It's not back. the first, it's not the first time. So anyways, we go, I look at his coach. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck you expect me to do about it. Our guy's ready to go. And he's like, well, my guy's career is so promising that if he can't get a glove that fits him, I'm not going to let him go out there and compete. And I'm like, this is the most schoolyard shit I've ever seen in my life. I was sticking my finger down in his glove and like, there's all kinds of space. I'm like, okay, how about this? Cut the wrap off. My guy will cut the wrap off. I'm not even going to ask him. He, I, he's a warrior. He's a gladiator. I know he'll do it. And he's got a promising career too. Well, then we got two guys that are fighting, potentially injuring themselves. This guy ends up pulling out of the fight because he was terrified of Jordan Sanford. Literally terrified. I went up to him and saw him. His head was buried in his arm. If I can't close my head, I'm not going to fight. I'm like, you're a gladiator. You're a gladiator. And you're going to pull out of a fight because of a glove that you bullshit. Who, you know, who knows? Maybe that was the fight where this guy was like, this isn't for me. That's what I we were talking about. I it. really like the workouts. Like for me, I hate getting fucking hit in the head. I don't like it. Yeah. I hate fucking, I really hate sparring. I, I would, I love the training. I like, I loved it doing this boxing. I love the training. I love learning how to hit the bag. I loved hit learning combinations and feeling comfortable knowing in my head, you know, you have those dreams. You ever have those dreams, those nightmares where you go to throw, dudes a, punch, are all you go to throw a punch yeah, there's dudes holding you down. There's I one mean, behind you. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the boxing dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. right. Yeah. When I'm sucking. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you don't like getting hit in the face. That's the point, right? Well, I know. Yeah, you, it sucks. you have those nightmares where you're, you're trying to yeah. hit somebody and your your punch is super slow yeah, that and ineffective, you off, and you're dude. like, oh, why can why can't I do this? But I mean, I love the workouts. I love no, learning something. Mm -hmm. You know, I love learning how to defend myself. But I fucking hate getting hit in the face. I just hate well, it. This guy had fought like seven or eight times. 
So if, if, if you make that decision, here's what I say. If you make that decision and you decide when you look into the eyes of Jordan Sanford, and I'm not blaming you because he's a scary fucking guy, but if you did make that decision go, I'm not going to fight now, when you've signed a contract and told a whole stadium full of people potentially that you are going to fight, mm-hmm. you show up and you fucking fight. And if you don't fight, fine. Come up to my guy and to me as a man and say, shit just got real for me. And I realized I just had to come into Jesus. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and you know what? If balls. you don't like getting hit and, and you're in that situation <laughs> and you've had an epiphany, come to me and say, I've had an epiphany. This sport isn't right for me. I'm terrified. I got in over my head and I'll go, okay, you're kind of a pussy, but you're honest. And I like that. You but know in, what I mean? in that dude's defense, and I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but Jordan Sanford has knocked everybody out like the fuck out like in the not- first round very fast very violent knockouts i mean they're they're scary looking knockouts yeah. and maybe somebody came up to him beforehand and said oh dude this guy's gonna fuck you up yeah you he know? was gonna he be a probably- blip on the radar and jordan sanford is a beast he he yeah, really he's is ridiculous. he's tyson we, are, is anybody able to uh, pull up these vi- do they have any videos of him and oh on youtube i'm sure there's sure? something i'll see what i can do i was trying to find your damn fights i couldn't i i, I found you coming into the colonel I stadium keep a low profile <laughs> <laughs> dude i, I love jordan the, sanford uh, versus jesus yeah okay. in that yeah. fight in that fight he knocks yeah. a guy out Needless to say, I say the, the whole YouTube fight. videos is he's five minutes long. So but I'm this, assuming this it goes kid pretty is uh, Tyson esque in his talent. Really? Yeah, he's he's a guy walked into my gym. He was throwing box. He was throwing punches on a heavy bag, like a professional <laughs> boxer would after five to six years of training. And I went in, go up to him, and I went, "Hey Jordan, where'd you box at? Where you know? Where'd you spend your time boxing? Because you've obviously boxed." He goes, "This is my second day, coach." And I was like. Well, where did you learn to throw punches like that? He's like, well, I, you know, I play a lot of UFC on Xbox, and he was dead serious. <laughs> really, he was dead serious. This kid was born to fight, essentially. And after this whole debacle unfolded at these local fights, he goes, "I don't want this to be a win. I don't want this coward on my record." I mean, like this. If I told this kid, "Your biggest enemy is yourself. If you keep your head straight, you'll be a world champion someday." Well, all right. How uh, help me understand how what are the inner circles? What what is the route you take from walking in from the street, no idea what you want to do, you just want to roll around Mm -hmm. to is UFC the pinnacle? Is that the is that the target you want to get to? What what is the what's the ladder you climb? Um, you know, the first thing you do is you come in and you you realize you come in and you realize that uh, you can do it. A lot of people walk into the gym. They want to get in shape. They want to learn how to defend themselves. Everybody's got their own reasons. Some people want to compete right out of the bat. You, you get into the gym and you start training, first of all, and you reassess what you're capable of. And uh, you get better. You work on skill, standing, on the ground. You go to all the fundamentals classes, and then eventually we invite you to the advanced class, which isn't dangerous. It's just a little bit more of an intense workout. Instead of you know, 30 to 40 minutes of technique and 10 minutes of live rolling, it might be exactly the opposite. It might be one advanced technique for 10 minutes we drill and go over it, and then we just we're rolling for an hour. Um, then eventually go to team hard drive practice, which is essentially a practice to test your metal in every area, whether it be stand-up ground, uh, just general conditioning. It's, it's a nasty one. We don't really talk a whole lot about what goes on there, but mm-hmm. um, it, it's, a, it's a really, really tough workout, like you would expect from an old-school you know, coach, wrestling coach or any other. So uh, it, you you do that and then you start fighting in the amateur circuit locally. You know, you can find amateur fights anywhere across the country, across the state and build up your career, go pro. Anybody can go pro. It's really not as glamorous as people think. It's just a lot of time in the gym. And when you get to a certain level, your coaches go, hey, if you're ready and you want to, you can. But I have a lot of people that come into hard drive have absolutely no intention of competing and that, you know, they're shitting their pants when they walk in there anyway, which bums me out because it's just not the way that place is. If you knew you'd be amazed at the type of people we have in there, but they go in there and they, Oh no, I'm not going to compete. I'm not going to pee. I'm not interested in fighting. Okay, cool. You know, <laughs> we don't expect you to. Then six months later, Hey coach, what do you think? What do you think I do in the cage? You know, they, ha- they ask themselves the, their own questions. You know, they look at themselves in the mirror and they see themselves changing and, Training in that environment and asking yourself those kinds of questions that I was talking about on a daily basis changes the way you, that you see yourself and the way that you see the world. It well, really obviously, does. it's a self-confidence booster. 
you start seeing yourself changing and, uh, and you're altering yourself. And I was like, well, wait a second. Maybe I, ha- I might have an opportunity to do something I never thought was possible. Yeah, feeling right. more comfortable rolling around on the mat. <clears throat> Gaining confidence. Right. Yeah. And for me, it's about what's honest. You know, you have to really come to terms with how good you are and how good you're not right away. You understand how humble you have to be and how long you have to be humble for. And we have a saying that that is, you know, leave your ego at the door. When people come in there with a lot of ego thinking they're tough guys in a group of guys that have trained together for 15 to 20 years, it's not a good situation for them. And you've had some guys come in with some pretty high egos. Oh, yeah. Back at the old place anyway. I remember hearing some stories. I don't know if that's been the case at the new place. Not not so much, and, you know, but there were some people that came in with their head up in the air and their nose up in the air and, and just putting off really bad vibes to, to all of these like brothers, these, you know, these war brothers that have went to war with each other time. They can sniff out bullshit and character pretty quickly. And uh, when you come into a situation like that, it, it really does humble you because it's, it shows you how much you're not capable of. And when somebody physically holds you down on the ground and chokes you until you just go, OK, uncle. <laughs> and then, and then six months later, you you continue to eat away at it, and you get to a point where you're not choking, you're not being choked out anymore by that guy. You can defend that choke that he used to get you in and dominate you in, and you can actually move around. And then when somebody else comes in, you just smash them. You go, whoa, things are different. You know, the way you see everything is very, very honest, and uh, it allows you to sniff out bullshit elsewhere outside of the gym. Pretty effective. I remember a time That's pretty awesome back at the old gym where somebody came in who was a wrestler and thought his shit didn't stink. Yeah. Thought he was just king shit. These MMA guys can't do nothing to me. I'm a wrestler. You know, I wrestle in college. This guy, well, I'll tell you what, this guy's a national champion. He was legit. And uh, in, in, it was either you or your brother just yeah. freaking schooled this guy and choked him out multiple times. Yeah, it was me. And just yeah. demoralized this dude, you know. Well, what, what had happened was, I remember exactly what you're talking about. This guy mm. came in with aviator sunglasses on. Nothing against aviators. I love them. Me too. They're <laughs> awesome. Um, had his, but, Mirrors but, on the inside. But had his aviators on and just nose in the air, chest out, strutting. I mean, this was something to behold. And I've seen some some cocky walks, but this guy took the fucking cake big time. Walks into the gym, gets into the ring. I want to spar. You got a mouthpiece? No, I don't need one. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to break your teeth out. You can't spar. Well, can I roll? Sure. So this guy, uh, Eric Vo, is in the gym. He's from Dubuque. He's always been a good buddy of our gyms. Um, he's training, and this guy gets in there, and the, you can tell that this guy's wrestling is not regular good wrestling. It's like high-level, high-level good wrestling. Like if he wants to throw you around, he's going to. Did he go to Co. Yeah. Okay. I won't name any names because at the time the guy was not in a good place and he's, you know, he's in a better place now, but, um, he came in and he was going with Vo and just fucking throwing Vo all over the ring, like Sue playing him and just, and Vo's a little guy, Vo's a little guy, yeah. but this guy was pretty little too. He was just such a good wrestler. He manhandled Vo. Like what weight class are we talking about? Like um, one of- at the time, the guy was probably like between, he's probably like 140, one, okay. 140 to 150. 50, 155, okay. um, but really put together in great shape at the time, competition shape. And Vo at the time was like 135, but stringy and not really that strong yet. And uh, this guy threw Vo around and was a dick about it. And you know, you know, you can tell when somebody's going hard and when somebody's going hard enough that they intend to hurt or cause some kind of injury. That was the intensity that he was going at. We call them spazzers. And so I was like, Vo looked up at me at one point. I'm at the edge of the ropes and he's getting thrown all over the place. He looks up at me. He's like, looks at me, coach, like panic. What am I supposed to do? I'm like, you're a fucking fighter, right? Like you fight in a cage, deal (laughs) with it. This is what you're going to have to deal with. And so the, the match ends and I go in there and this guy thinks he's just king shit. And I grappled him and I threw a triangle on him immediately, immediately. And he picks me up like two feet off the air or two feet off the ground. And I underhook his leg so that he can't stand all the way up with me and, and slam me. But he still slams me as hard as he possibly can. I can tell he's being very colorful with it. And that's when I put on the, I put on the show. Put on a clinic, so to speak. <laughs> I, I choked him out like you know, five to 10 times in five minutes. And I was very nasty about the positions that I put him in. And he sat in a pile of himself on the edge of the mat, just completely in shock for like 10 minutes. Like his ego had been completely violated he left and we didn't see him again for you know probably like a year actually i've seen more of him lately and he's gotten a lot better his mind was just you know he his his ego was really built up at the time and he thought he was going to come in and just throw everybody around beat people up and 
I, you know, I wouldn't expect to go into a wrestling room and out wrestle the wrestling room. Right. right. I would expect yeah. to get taken down repeatedly because <clears throat> that's what those guys special in specialize in. And he came in thinking wrestling was going to beat everything. Well, right. life teaches. I you. tell you what, that's so true. Cause I remember the first time I came to your basement back when you were still training at in your basement I thought to myself, you know, I'm bigger than all these guys. I didn't come in with an attitude or anything. That's, yeah, and that's you're, not my style. you're in good shape too. Yeah, and I was strong. yeah, and I was very strong, very good shape. I'm a bigger guy, and I thought to myself, it's, yeah, it'll just it'll be not not that big of a deal. Next thing I know, I, I find myself getting choked <laughs> repeatedly by guys. And my lights going out by guys who weigh 50 to 60 pounds less than I do. You know, so size matters. But man, when when you're that skilled, you take an unskilled guy, a fresh guy off the street who has no jujitsu background, and put him up against somebody who has a very deep jujitsu background. It doesn't matter. No, it, it really matter. does not matter. You'll get put in positions that where you're just like, "What do I do from here?" I mean, yeah. I, I have no control over my body right now. Yeah. Next thing you know, look, I'm, I'm worried about the position that I'm in. Then all of a sudden, I get arms around my neck, and I'm about to go unconscious. You know, so. Well, yeah. I mean, the silliness is that you're you're fighting so hard. I, I remember this mm. in wrestling. You're fighting so hard because the guy is pushing you a certain way, and you're like, "Ah, I, I, he wants me to go this way. I'm not going to let myself go this way. I'm going to push the other way." And you end up throwing yourself into exactly where he wanted yeah. you to be. And so understanding that from wrestling, so I can true. only fucking imagine the yeah. Pandora's box yeah. that I'm walking into in a jiu-jitsu setup. Well, or or, or jiu-jitsu, wrestling, boxing. You have three disciplines that are all going on at one time, yeah. and you only have one of them down. You know, and so it's like you can only imagine. What but if it is of- grappling, is you know, you, you'd think that straight grappling, jiu-jitsu, you know, size is going to matter a lot if you're even if you're not trained or understand much about jujitsu but man it, it really doesn't matter much no. if you don't know what you're doing if you don't know what you're doing at all you're you're, you're fucked i don't care who you, i don't care how small the guy is i really don't well in the wrestling you know? match ends on the ground you know if if you pin somebody the, the match is over you know in tra- in a traditional match whereas jujitsu that's where they begin you know that's where triangles and arm bars and sweeps and submissions and all that stuff lies on in a stand-up in a stand-up grappling exchange Jiu-Jitsu black belt rarely is going to beat a judo black belt in any kind of throw. They're not going to ever beat a Olympic wrestler ever in any kind of takedown. I mean, very rarely maybe, but highly unlikely, you know, but on the ground, Jiu-Jitsu is a different thing. Jiu-Jitsu, especially Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu says, we're not going to focus on being big because the Gracies weren't big. They were small right. and they had to adapt to it. What they're going to focus on is when somebody big gets on us, we're going to use whatever leverage and technical prowess we can to eliminate their strength advantage. And it, the only thing that's going to beat a, a skilled guy is a is a bigger, stronger skilled guy. I, I remember watching the Gracies and going, oh, my God, he's grabbing him and pulling him down on top of him. He's basically, <laughs> he's basically saying, please lay on top of me. Yeah, get in here. You know? and, get some, and I couldn't wrap my head around that. man time. <laughs> he was like the only guy that was very good at jiu-jitsu back in those days, right? Oh, yeah. Well, in the UFC, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and the Gracies set the, US, the first UFC up to illustrate Brazilian jiu-jitsu's effectiveness. Like, Horian Gracie was the first one who, who started the UFC and then he sold it to SEG who sold it to Zufa. But it was originally set up to display their arts. They knew that they would do well, but the world didn't know that they would do so well against such diverse competition. You know? Well, you look up Frank Shamrock's fights on U- mm. UFC and uh, his brother's fights and you're thinking, oh my God, these guys are just fucking crazy. Look at these takedowns. They're just slamming people. And then Frank Shamrock goes in against Gracie, and he's fucking tapping within the first round. And oh, you know Ken, the post, Ken Shamrock, yeah, yeah, the post the post fight interview was like he goes, I I I I had I had no idea how to how to do this. This, is so, to this is so completely different for me. Yeah, you know, yeah, I had no idea how to even work against this. It's amazing when you think of, I mean, stereotypically you think of this nightmare in a dark alley, this guy coming at you. And you think, you know what? This a little guy, you know, he he can somewhat take care of himself. Oh, you know, yeah, he, you don't have to be totally scared out of your mind when you just look at something because the shamrocks are fucking intimidating looking motherfuckers. Do you, yeah. Are you, are you are you obviously you're a fan of UFC? Do you have fighters that you like and that you follow or not really? You're into your- you know, when I was a kid, um, and I say kid, you know, meaning. 
14, 15, when I first got into the UFC and in mixed martial arts in the really the beginning, um, I was a big fan of Hoist Gracie, obviously, because, you know, he really showed me a different look of martial arts on the ground that I knew that I needed at that point that I didn't have. Um, and Ken Shamrock, I thought he was cool. He was real theatric and big and vocal and boisterous. And I had favorites for a while. When we started competing, I stopped looking at them as sports heroes. When we started competing really seriously, I basically, now I watch the U.S. I don't even know when the UFCs were on. They're on so much anyway. But um, now when I watch them, I'm, I'm watching them basically for technical information. You know, I'm watching them to study people, see what they do. It's more of a job related thing. I'm not really interested. Yeah, there's actually one. Uh, there's actually one on tonight. Yeah. Is there? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Who is it? I don't even I don't know. Is it a pay per view or is it a Fox one? It's pay per view. It's pay per view. Is it? No, okay. yeah. it's pay per view. I, did, I was like, oh, I wonder what these guys are doing after the <gasps> Wait a podcast. Is it, is it GSP versus Hendrix, baby? No. It better not be. It's no, not. I don't want to miss that. No, it's, it's not. I don't yeah. want to see GSP. All right. Well, out. let's figure this out. We know. Oh, you know what? That <laughs> GSP, that's a great segue. Yeah. That's a great segue. You know how he's been accused of oiling up, yeah. slicking up? Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you see that even? Um, even well, I, I saw mean, where, we're at, where you're at. I I mean, saw, yeah, you see that from time to time, but you, you don't really see it. And when people accuse people of it, usually the people they're accusing are the ones that are winning the fights. Um, but I know that there's a lot of fighters that d- takes a uh, sodium bath and they'll do like a Epsom salt bath the night before weigh-ins to cut a little bit of water out that, that salt draws water out of your body. Okay. And some of them would put baby oil in the bath and it will sp- essentially soak into the skin and pores and then when they start to sweat the next you know the next time they sweat the the idea is that that oil comes out and wow there's nothing you can do to say i oiled because it's in my skin right right is this is this any sport where somebody finds an edge or they find a way to alter something to give them an edge and something um there there it could be yeah but think about oil so oil or if i grease up and i'm a i'm what am i am i a striker that doesn't want to get taken down fine. So I'm, I'm an oiled up striker that doesn't want to get taken down. And then I slip on a decal and then the guy jumps on my back. And because I have oil on me easily slides his forearm underneath my throat, and chokes me out. <laughs> okay. It, there are variables in each direction. So if you are oiling, it's, it's basically pointless. It's, it's an, some kind of obsessive thing that you have that makes you think you have a mental edge. I don't think he's oiling. If he is, I don't think it matters. You know, if somebody gets on that chin, they get on that chin. I can't wait till he loses. Pers- great perspective, though. You can't wait till what? GSP loses. You don't like GSP? <laughs> no, I'm so I'm, he's so boring <laughs> to me. I want to see Ben Askren, current Bill Tour welterweight champion. I want to see and him unstoppable takedown. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's like what twelve and zero. Nobody's yeah. even come close to beating him. I wish Dana White would give him a contract, give him like one or two fights, which he will good. he will win those two fights, and then give him a title shot. That's what I, I would think. love to see that. I think one fight, honestly. I think if he's got a dominant run of Bellator title defenses, he goes into them, gets one fight if he shows the dominance that he shows in Bellator yeah. and UFC, give him a title shot. I'm bummed. I'm going to be out of town for the Bellator fight. Ugh. Oh, yeah, Bellator's coming to town. Yeah. God, I was in. I was so ready to go. D-Law. Okay. D-Law. <laughs> how, how many fighters do you have in that? Two. You have two fighters yep. in that. Is Jordan in that one? No, he's going to be fighting in the RFA uh, December 25th. Or, I'm sorry, October 25th. Um, Steve Carl is going to be fighting for the World Series of Fighting title on the 26th of October in uh, in, Bay, in uh, Miami, Florida. Um, Who I've cornered, by the way. Yeah, no big deal No big for deal Rock. for me. I was on TV. <laughs> Corner, not a problem. On the reg. <laughs> he actually won because of me, too, first yeah. round. Rocky actually gets to do some pretty cool shit because yeah, of our friendship. That's what I'm get, that's yeah, that's what I'm gathering. That's what I'm yeah. gathering. Well... Uh, yeah, well, I don't really. I, it's pretty common stuff, but he's been with us to some pretty cool shit. The two, the two guys I've cornered, I've I've cornered Jared Downing and I've cornered Steve Carl, and they've finished their opponents in both times I was in their corner. Not saying I was, <laughs> I was a determining factor, but I'm just saying. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. You might be that lucky rabbit's foot. I tell you what, in Jared's uh, fight that I that I I cornered him in. He was getting himself in some terrible positions. You were corner. You were in the, his corner that Which day too. Which one was it? Bellator, uh, Kansas City. Oh, Power yeah, yeah, Light yeah. District. Power Light. Yeah. Yeah, and he was getting himself in some terrible him positions. In arm bars and shit. Yeah, he was in an arm bar where you would, at, in any other fight, you would think, "Oh, it's over. It's over." I, I almost did think yeah. it was over. I thought it was too. But then going into the third round, he's standing there. He, he Jared's the type of fighter that never looks like he's worried about anything. 
you know, he looks at me in, in his corner. He goes, he just gives me a wink. He just winks at me. Goes out there and stops <laughs> the, the guy. Jokes the guy out real quick. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. It's funny. For all the people that get hurt doing MMA, which there are some people that get hurt, a lot of fights go off without a hitch where nobody really takes any real damage. It ends in a submission. Both guys go home a little sore, stiffer, and everything's fine. And there's a war every once in a while. but Like you know, the Jones fight. Like the Jones fight. And those are those are glorious fights. That's what every fighter lives for is to have a, a moment like that where they can say – the winner and the loser really made no difference whatsoever. It was about the fight. Yeah, because I can't stand. I mean, there was a lot of fights when I first started watching UFC where people would literally walk around the ring for five oh, rounds. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. They just keep, yeah, they just keep uh, testing each other. Oh, God, I hated that shit. Shitty. And now, I gotta figure it out now you've first got, round, right? you got fans that boo now when there's good fights going on and good right. action. When there's yeah. good drown scrambles that the crowd doesn't understand because they're drunken. That bugs me. Miramuses. I yeah. love watching a good ground fight. Because you understand it. Though. Yeah, that's I understand why. the chess game that's going on down there. But, yeah, you're right. The drunk fans, they want a if, little more action. If you don't, don't understand the chess game of the jiu-jitsu, which most American fans don't, Japanese fans do, and it's it's different watching yeah. a Japanese event because oh my they're gosh. dead silent. There's not a pin drop in a 100,000-person. In a really? Oh, yeah. yeah. They're dead quiet. Then when there's this really, really good grappling exchange or a striking exchange, there's this little – it's like they're watching a, a play. True. Like, the, like they're just yeah. admiring the art, you yeah. know? And that's why a lot of people that's, watch that, different. That, that, I, the idea of that, mm-hmm. it kind of makes me hard. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I mean, just the idea that somebody can be, that you can appreciate. You sit a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm on the other side <laughs> of the table here. Well, I mean, but it makes you appreciate right. just how, how much intelligence, how much skill goes into what you are watching right. that they appreciate it sure you know it's not just a bunch of dumb brutes that's what it is drinking here. beer Arr, exactly and wanting to fight in the stands in my day i could have benched 225 and fucking kick the shit out of a whole carload of guys <laughs> <You> <laughs> they know, always right. talk about what they would do if they were in the cage. yeah and if yeah. they wouldn't have missed their shot back in the day i mean there are i mean granted there are some amazing freaks of nature out there you could pound them in the face and it doesn't matter. I, I knew a guy in the military who could drink uh, fifths of alcohol, and he and he would not pass out. He wouldn't throw up. I mean, there's people that are just kind of freaks of nature. Me, right. you hit me in the head, I get a headache. I'm like, all right, I'm kind of done. You know? Yeah, I'm good. No need to get hit if I'm not yeah, getting paid for it. Yeah, I don't. Let's work this out. Let's yeah, talk about this. I'm good. <laughs> but there are those people who can take a lot of fucking punishment. I mean, yeah, like there are. Um, Iceman Chuck Liddell. I just. <laughs> There, there are those people. It's kind of like those guys who love when it was the WWF. You know, they mm-hmm. had those iconic people like Hulk Hogan and uh, Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, brother. Oh, the Macho Man, Macho, macho man. man. What about uh, was it uh, Ravishing Rick Rude? Oh, oh yeah. Rude was the man. <laughs> he was Jason. great. Who was the guy the two by four? Hexaw Jim Duggan. Hexaw oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Jim Duggan and uh, you had, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake Andre the Snake the Roberts. Oh, Scott one. Hall. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the Scott Hall doc? We've watched Dude, the, Scott the Scott Hall, Hall documentary. Dude, the Scott Hall documentary is one of the most depressing things I've ever seen. Talk about life. a downward spiral. It sucks, Holy is it like shit. The, is it like the wrestler with, uh, what's his face? It's Razor Ramon. His real name is yeah. Scott Hall. But with, yeah. He was with teamed up with Nash. Kevin yeah. Nash, big sexy. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. His life took a freaking dive and no nosedive hey yo real bad <laughs> it i was mean bad. it was really bad <laughs> he was going to one of those barn shows and he was all drunk in the in, in the ring just saying killers. stupid shit you yeah. know and like couldn't yeah. even stand up and people had to hold him while people hit him over the head with a chair it was oh bad. it was bad oh yeah, no yeah that's those, how it ended and we the, were like ah those wrestlers man once they're done once their heyday's over they seem to go through some pretty serious depressing times. Yeah. You know, well, a lot I mean, of them end up dying early. Well, well imagine yeah. being the center of attention. Right. For all these things. And the one thing that defines you as a person or an athlete is over. Is over. I mean, you yeah. are a pseudo actor. You, I mean, you are. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're putting your body. I mean, there there is no denying. Jumping off the top rope. I was watching some horrendous uh, oh, sports man. injuries yeah. the other day oh, on sweet. YouTube. There was a collection of them. That sounds awesome. And there's a bunch God. of there's a bunch of wrestlers jumping off the top rope, snapping those legs as soon as they hit the ground. You know, yeah. just psh, snap because they put Benoit. all their weight on one leg. You guys remember Chris Benoit, the guy who freaked out and killed his family? No. Oh. He was a WWE wrestler. He 
killed his wife and his kids. It was like on national news and yeah, everything. Really? Two or yep. three years ago. Well, anyways, I, 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 that's not the point though. But the point was his finishing move <laughs> was a headbutt off the top rope where he just jumped head first into yeah, the guys. It, it looks oh. so dangerous. It, no, man. it takes a huge toll on the body. And oh. here's the thing: like a lot of there's a lot of MMA guys who are like, "Oh, pro wrestling's fake." But, oh, but it, here's the deal. These guys smash their bodies up so bad. Yep. They're they're completely uh, dependent on painkillers. They're usually alcoholics because they're depressed. And a lot of times they're coked up because they're going from show to sh- – people don't understand. Show yeah, they're on the to road. Show oh, to two, show. 300 days yeah, so of you, the year. You got steroids, potentially painkillers, sometimes alcohol, and oftentimes cocaine mixed together. <laughs> you just described my Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You, you've got oh, a very short night? shelf life. You know what I mean? You're not looking to, to, to survive. Well, anymore. I assumed from watching The Wrestler with – why is that actor – I'm blanking on his Mickey name. Rourke. Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke. That when he's, I mean, because the guy is just phenomenally built, which is obviously probably steroid based part of it. Yeah. Oh, is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. Okay. I mean, he just looks incredible, and I know he's an older guy. This, I think that movie depicted the idea of these guys just they're still wanting. It. I mean, he's sleeping in his van and going place to place, and then the guy's like, "Hey, uh, my shtick is I staple people with a staple gun," and so part of things like the guy's like chink, 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 in in his skin. Because that's part of the the show that this guy does, and I'm like, who who allows that to take place to their body? Well, it's you know, like, like Jesus. if you haven't thoughts. been in the military, yeah. if you haven't been in the military, I have. It sounds like a bad. That out. Well, fine, I'll point it out. I'll rub it in. But if you haven't been in that, it sounds horrible. Oh my God, somebody stapled you. But when you're in the military and you're getting like blood wings pinned on, and and uh, or you're getting rank, and they're like, okay, uh, it's not socially acceptable anymore to haze and to and to pop those pins into people's skin anymore. But we're going to do it anyway. But so, <laughs> Pretty much. So, so officially, we're not going to have that ceremony. But if you want to step over to the left, yeah. we're going to pretend not to see it. So if you want to go through that hazing event and and have that feeling, you can, but we're not endorsing it. In other words, God, yeah. fucking you, pussy, you, or you, you, you have, have, you have 40 be. people fucking pull those pins out of your skin and pop them back into your skin. That, man. Some staples? Yeah. That doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, fuck it. So you got uh, pinned like that in airborne yeah. school? Yep, Did you? yep. Blood wing. I had blood wings, and then every time I I went up in rank, everybody above that had a chance. I was given the opportunity. I'll keep coming. That flying. never <laughs> happened to me. That never <laughs> happened to me. You never, you didn't get that? No, never happened. I'm thinking did they that. warn? Did they say, "Hey, don't do that"? We're warning you. You know, that, or was it just not not even a thought? I think shit changed a little bit. Um, during the time I was in, I think you were in there before. When did you get out? I got out in 98. Okay. I went in, in 2002. So I think things had changed a little bit by then because I was never even pressured to do anything like that. I can't help but think about junior who's in. Oh, he's in the air force. Come on. Come on. He's my kid. He's going to be around all these hot chicks. Blew out everybody's ears. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) He's going to be around all these hot chicks. I want to do him. Oh, yeah. time. Hey, can you help me with this EOD test? Hey, Forrest. Sure, I'll help you. Hey. Can you, can you study with something in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that uh, you think that there are going to be heavyweights that ever have the kind of like long, drawn out five minute, uh, five round like flyweights do? No, in I, MMA, was that ever possible? I mean, is it just physically impossible because there's so much muscle mass yeah. and blood and yeah, the the heavyweights. You know, I it's kind of funny because I was talking to my buddy the other day about Alistair Overeem. Uh, what I want mm. out of the heavyweights is I want them to be allowed to juice to the hell. hell yeah, I was just gonna let say them, that. Let them juice. Wow, let really? them do as much yeah. steroids as possible right. if that's what they want to do. Because heavyweights for me. Not all of them. Some of them are very talented and very fun to watch, but most heavyweights are just dreadfully boring. Let all fighters juice. And and even a lot of boxing heavyweights. Mike Tyson, not not a prime example of that, but but other heavyweight boxers have been just kind of lumbering and slow compared to the sure. lighter weights. I I mean, it doesn't sound politically correct to say it, but I'd love to see Alistair Overeem fight heavyweight juiced, as juiced as we can get him. You know what I mean? And let the other <laughs> let the other heavyweights do the same thing, and then let the lighter weight guys move around a little quicker, like like nature allows them. Sounds now, politically okay. correct to me. Now, sounds fine. Do, to you, me. do you yeah. think the problem is that we don't? Why, why don't Why don't we just have sports and we say, okay, listen, you're gonna be a professional athlete if you want to if you want to play at this level, 
juicing is optional. I, and if go, you want to be it the probably best, goes to do what, it. It probably goes to the libertarian kind of point of view of saying, if that's what you want to do, it's your body. Then it's your body. Yeah. You go right ahead and do it. And if it means that yeah. it makes something more exciting or makes you a better athlete, then so be it. If you own your body, yeah. then you should be able to put inside your body what you want to put inside. And if you it. choose to fuck it up in that instance, well, as far as I'm concerned, you and then, I talked so, about this just the it. other day. We were, I was saying that, like he who shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> what Joe Rogan says. If we had things like shamans around and they were able to say, this is how you take it. You're in a safe environment. We've been educated. This is the right way to do things. Drug um, usage wouldn't be as bad as it is. But what we have nowadays is people who want to get bigger, who want to get stronger, who want to have this experience, who who don't want to feel pain. And there's nobody to guide them. Making it, make it illegal kind of gives people that curiosity, I think. Well, or or the lack of intelligence to do it correctly. You you may bring up a great point about educating people about it. Kind of changes the way that uh, usage happens because in Portugal, I don't know if I've talked about this with you guys before. No. Ten, twelve years ago, Portugal decided to decriminalize all drugs and treat it as a an illness like we treat alcoholism in this country. And you know the result after about a decade, they found out that. That there was a decline in the in the abuse of all drugs once they decriminalized everything right. and started treating it uh, drug abuse like an illness and not like a crime. Instead of caging these people up, they get them the help that they needed, and then also they had a big effort towards educating people about the drugs at the same time while they decriminalize things. So yeah, that's that idea has been put into practice and it's had positive results. And it works. Yeah. One thing that's important to note about Portugal too is they they went after that option for decriminalization because they were out of money. They couldn't imprison these people anymore. They'd put so many people into jail that they proactively decriminalized. What happened was the prisons, you know, they're emptied. They didn't have to take care of as many people. The, the cost that it took to um, educate people and rehabilitate people that were truly addicted to drugs was far, far less than what it took to put them in a cell and to take care of them 24 hours a day. It was a stunning success. I think it was, yeah, I think it was five or 10 years later, they come out with this report and it's like 60% drops in overdoses. And I mean, this is real lives. You know? Sure. That's, that's the only way that you can measure this is in lives saved. Do you think HGH is it a steroid-like substance? I mean, what is human growth hormone? Can you take too much of it so you look like he did in The Wrestler? Or can you take a certain amount and it leans you out? Like a, you know, certain steroids bulk you up. Sometimes they shred you out. I mean, well, is, is HGH let's, let's work like that? The, uh, the drug person. <laughs> Who, me? Well, I, I don't know much I mean, about it. You're posing the question like, hey, let's yeah, he's looking right at is me. there somebody that just knows their shit about drugs? No, I do know this much, though. I <laughs> never meant it that way at all. I, I do know this much, though. HGH is not used just by athletes. It's used by very rich and famous celebrities my mother, to make themselves look younger. My mother, and they're not my mother uses it. it. My mom loses yeah, it. Yeah, see, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So, And she writes some amazing porn. <laughs> oh, very nice. Is I that from HGH? I can't wait to tell her about this podcast. Is that from HGH? She can hear that. She's a part of it. God, yeah, that'd be great. I wonder if I took HGH, if I'd start feeling No, it. she goes to a doctor and gets injections of yeah. HGH, but she's using it in the idea. See, if, if somebody said a little bit of HGH, a little bit of testosterone will help you out in this area. And I'd be like, okay, a little bit here and there. She doesn't want to work out, drinks like a fish, and then does HGH to try to somehow, I'm sure, sort of yeah, kind of like balance that or something. No. <laughs> exactly. And so that's not used in a healthy way. Yeah. So I'm wondering. You don't think that's the, the right cocktail? Um, no. <laughs> HGH in, in, in alcohol probably isn't the best the best mix. But, you know, I think people should be able to take whatever they want. I, I don't think there's a problem with taking HGH. I don't know that much about it. If somebody tells me they take it for whatever reason, hey, I'm, you know, I want to look a little, feel a little younger, I, I can care less. If if Stallone endorses it and carries it through airports, <laughs> then then fine. But and you know, it looks like he does. Yeah. Jesus. And, and he's yoked. And, you know, if he he's still alive, a lot of other actors his age, you know, have kicked the bucket. So, yeah, I don't really have a problem with it. I don't know that much about it, and I I wouldn't be opposed to taking it if I felt I needed to. But I think the bigger the bigger issue in this country isn't you know how do I get stronger, how do I feel better. It's it's how do I eat better. You know what I mean? Oh. Sure. People's diets are just complete shit. So you have people run into you have people run into to GNC, run into these different nutritional stores, going, "Give me a powder or a pill that will make me pretty." Right. And it's like 
this is common sense. You know what I mean? We know as a, as a culture and society that what, what comes out of the ground is good for us to eat and it's optimal for us to eat. And any refinement or processing of that probably isn't positive. Yet, the way that our food is culturally, the majority of what's available to us at cheap, cheap prices. Do you talk about that? At hard at hard drive, do you is that part of what you um, do? Do you ever bring that up? To I always bring up diet. I constantly bring up diet, and I know this because I ate shit food for a long time, and I was training two to three times a day, you know, so I could justify eating horrible food. You burn the calories off. I burn sure. it all off. But then I thought about it, and I went, you know, I'm burning these calories off or this weight off, but this is still shitty food. That it's I'm not eating. good fuel. It's not good right. fuel, and, and it's not good for me on a cellular level. And I knew that, but I, I just chose to ignore it because I, I justified training. When I went raw and ate nothing but nuts, veggies, fruits, and I got a, um, a Nutribullet, and then after that I bought a Vitamix mixer, which is the absolute, one of the most critical dietary aids I've ever had. Probably the is most, the blender. Is the high power commercial crazy Fuck fucking yeah. industrial Fuck your blender. Vitamix. I got a Blendtec. You can bitches. just take all the produce. <laughs> Blend, and Blendtec's a good blender pulverize too. Pulverize it all. Blendtec's a good blender too. But, I kept going back and forth between but, the two. I'm um, telling you, it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. 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 When oh, you yeah. when you can shred that, that much nutritionally and put it in your body, and I was just telling Rocky about this, in the United States, we have the most diverse array of fresh food available probably on the planet in, or in most countries. Sure. We ha- we can go get nutritionally concentrated foods and come up with concoctions that nobody on the planet before in human history could create. We've got know? those options. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's exactly what I do at the Vitamix. I have just every superfood you can imagine frozen that I can, kale, spinach, fresh fruits and vegetables. And I went raw and I got rid of all the dairy that I could eat. And I still ate lean meat from time to time, bison, chicken, you know, things without a bunch of shit pumped into it. And you eat that way for two weeks and you never look back. You, you know, know what? You know, I think it's exactly. getting better because there's yeah. a significant portion of the population that's starting to be more conscious about the food they put in their bodies. Yep. You're seeing health food stores pop up a lot more. Yep. You're seeing uh, the free market react to uh, the Monsanto Protection Act by uh, voluntarily labeling their foods, whether they're genetically modified or not. So there's a demand for people. People are, are showing a demand to want to eat healthier, and I think that's a, such a great thing. You know, well, with enough movies like yeah. Forks to Knives yeah. or what was that? Fat Sick Nearly, and Nearly Dead. Fat Sick and Nearly Dead. That, that, I mean, that guy. That, that, that alone. That, not only his his journey in that movie great, but it's that truck driver he meets in Iowa right. and that, that changes and things. And that really, like, if if anything that I've seen has really woken me <clears> up <throat> to how shitty I eat, and I still eat shitty. It was that movie. It was fat, sick, and nearly dead. I watched that movie and I thought, getting a blend tech. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get it. I got a juicer upstairs. I got a kick ass juicer. I have a kick ass blender. And I did, I did the, the 10 day or the nine day or whatever juice, blend. just juice, just juicing. I felt great. You yeah. Had I had some. epiphany about, oh my God, I'm putting so much shit in my mouth. I was eating constantly sodas mm-hmm. and chips and candy bars all, constantly throughout the day. And when I was doing that juicing, I thought, man, I, I'm really, I feel great. I'm not bloated. I don't feel crappy. Pure, clean. Yeah, yeah. but I still, I, I stopped that. I went right back to, it's an addiction. I think it, 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 it is an addiction. There was There was a study that just came out. I'd have to find it on my my phone. Um, but what it, what it said is shitty food and fast food is just as addictive as illicit drugs are because of the response that they create on your body. Nutritionally, they're completely devoid of nutrition. They are, it's basically shit food, carbs, horrible quality protein, and a lot of fat in fast food. You eat it, you feel full for a second. Your body's tricked into feeling full, but nutritionally you're getting nothing. So as soon as that passes, you're ready to eat again. What I what I adopted is I, I use my Vitamix twice a day. I drink smoothies at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Um, I still eat. I'll still have a burger. You know, I, I try to I try to eat bison as much as I possibly can. And we have a sponsor that helps us out. And bison, if you guys haven't had it, is fucking. Amazing. I love bison. Yeah. I bison, bison burgers are the best. Everything is good. Who's, with bison. who's your sponsor? Iowa Bison. 
Um, they're up in Dubuque. They have a free range bison farm in this. Fuck, all I am fed. all over that shit. I told you about this shit. No, uh, you told me that he does that, but you didn't give me specifics. I told you. All right. Don't even lie. <laughs> but uh, you said it. You know, I still it. eat that in the way I, I try to. I'm, I'm a caveman. That's what I'm trying to think about. If I couldn't grow it, find it, forage it, kill it, I don't try to eat it. But do I still have ice cream? You bet your ass. Sometimes I still have ice cream. I'll oh, still yeah. eat a half a gallon sometimes. I mean, is it hard for you Indeed. with your family? At home? Um, no, my daughter is great. My daughter likes eating healthy. She asks me for smoothies all the time. My my son Ronan is a little bit more on the junk foodie side, but he'll he'll eat what I cook him. Um, and my my fiance is an athlete, so she likes to eat good too, even though starbursts are up her alley every once in a while. <laughs> oh, um, my 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 athlete at home is uh nerds. Nerds. <laughs> Nerds. 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 <laughs> I was thinking of ogre when I hear that word. <laughs> Ogre's the man. So how much so do you eat a certain amount of protein every day? Like lean bison, is that kind of the way you go? Or do you mix it up quite a bit or I, just kind of do whatever? And I mix it up and I, I'll get protein from whey. You know, I'll get whey protein, mix it up in smoothies with me sometimes. Sometimes I get a lot of protein just from from uh, you know, like peanuts, uh almonds, a lot of almonds. But I just try to eat as raw as I possibly can and drink as much water as I can. And when I do that, I feel like literally I'm electric. When I feel like I'm in peak shape and I've got that dietary intake, I feel like I have limitless amounts of energy. Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting feeling psychologically and physically. And, and I, I, I can only presume that most people don't understand what it's like to be in that kind of physical condition and be eating that high quality of food. But once you get to that point, you never, ever want to eat shit. And you know what's one of the best benefits of eating that clean, from my own personal experience, is is you never feel bloated. No. Everything just feels totally cleaned out. And tight. At all times. And tight. Your stomach doesn't – and and what's funny is most people can't even relate to that because they've never experienced it. Right. So they they think that right now I don't feel bloated. Well – you know, I actually do feel bloated because if I go through a weak cleanse or whatever the case may be, everything leans up, gets tight, gets really, really strong. And the biggest difference that I noticed and the thing that I swear to the the people that I train and and coach is the mental acuity is completely different. When you get a high nutritional uh, diet, you can think more clearly. Your sleep is better. It's just nothing but layers and layers of proof that what we've been doing for the last 20 to 30 years is completely backwards. Do you do a multivitamin and something else as well to help yourself out? Because, I mean, um, not all vegetables have all the things they're supposed to have these no, days. No, but, I, you know, I do take some dietary supplements and vitamins when I'm going into competition time. But generally, no. I, the way I see it is if I eat balanced amounts <clears> of fish, <throat> poultry, you know, meat or lean, lean red meat like bison with a lot of veggies and a lot of fruits and a lot of nuts – I've got enough fiber to flush out the good quality protein that I'm eating. You know, I, I try to relate to myself, like I said, like a caveman. What is does a caveman happen upon a dead bison every fucking day? No, of course they don't. But when they do, they'll eat the shit out of that bison or they'll preserve it. <laughs> if yeah. you guys would have got here just five minutes earlier, we got some deer upstairs. Oh, Ooh, damn. Deer's, deer's great too. Yeah, it's we got some lean. deer. Junior got me some venison before he uh, shipped off. Oh Jesus! Shut up! I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Shut up! Don't pussify this. (laughs) I love it that we started talking about mixed martial arts. Started talking about hard drive MMA, and now we're into eating raw. Yeah, yeah. uh, There was a really interesting, and I'll put it in the discussions, the link to this TED talk. But this guy talked about uh, he's an atheist, right? And he's talking about the the greatness of religion. All right, And, and I'll. Trust me, I'll bring this back to what we're talking about. That, here that alone, an atheist who's talking about the greatness of religion yeah, has got I'm, me I'm locked in. Now. Yeah. Well, because he talks about how great the way that they that they handle religion. You know, there's you you say so many prayers a day. You look, you, they have this whole uh, way that they go about their religious experience. It's it's this whole way of living. And you go to church on Sunday and you and you kneel and you and you have your rosary beads and you're it's doing habitu- this. And it's a habitual thing, right? This, it's this so ritualistic. Right? Where, where's Ceremonial. the greatness? Where's right. the greatness come in? Yeah. Well, the cool thing <laughs> is if we applied those types of rules to what we want to be better at, and hopefully, well, you're going to hear repeatedly on this podcast over and over things that we want to be better at. I want to be better at eating eating better and eating raw. You know, should be brought up continuously. It should be like this religious experience. When you listen to this podcast, you should hear things over and over again. And it's okay to hear things over and over again because you need that to change. Mm -hmm. And that's what religion kind of had the market cornered 
they had <clears throat> such a great way of of uh, marketing this to the masses, and and we really need to look at how we live our lives and and apply. If you're not r- truly religious, apply the same type of ritualistic habits to what you want to be good at. And eating raw, I mean, you're thinking about it all the time, every day, and you feel better and you feel cleansed mentally, physically. Well, in like when I would compete in MMA and I would cut five or 10 pounds or not, not ever 10, actually just five to six pounds. I'd sit in a sauna and lose five or six pounds of water. And what I'd feel like garbage, just complete garbage, you know, just from six pounds. And I saw people cutting 10, what's going on. What I found was it was because I was eating garbage. There was garbage food inside of my body, probably caking the lining of my intestine to a degree. And then when I got to a dehydrated state, that, that stuff was literally toxifying and making me sick. When I cut weight the last time I was on a raw diet, um, was able to lean out and lose huge amounts of weights doing just a couple workouts a day. I mean, losing 10 pounds in a week type of weight and feeling good. Usually you lose 10 pounds a week, you know, in a week and your immune system takes a hit and gets sick. Um, I was fine. And it was only because of the fuel that I put in. So when I did cut that seven, eight pounds of water out, I felt like a million bucks. If I would have had junk food in me, I would have felt like I was on my deathbed. And, you know, in terms of diet and how we see it and how we, we make it a part of our culture or, you know, our, our discipline every day, we have, you know, people now that, you know, they want to go into a diet as a fad. You know, this is a diet isn't really doesn't encompass all things nutritional anymore. It what it says in our in our modern society is this is something I'm going to try and almost certainly fail at what diet to me is in, in a raw diet or a healthy diet is changing your lifestyle to understand it's much, much easier to enjoy a smoothie now than it is to look at your kids in the face when you're dying of cancer. Yeah, that's a very positive. I'm going to use that next time when my <laughs> wife says, did uh, somebody mow the lawn? I'm like, no, I just used a bunch of kale. Like, well, that'll be my answer. There you go. You you know, know? The, the sad part is I when on when I was juicing and, and when I was <clears throat> using a juicer, not deballing, when I was using a du- <laughs> juicer and using my blend tech and and doing these smoothies, my kids love it. My kids are going to take whatever I give them, and if I if I'm doing it and I'm loving it and I'm or I'm acting like I love it, sure, you know, and it smells good. Roll off. They're gonna them. they're gonna use it. Your you kids know? are amazing when it comes to smoothies. They love it. But I've stopped doing it. I've stopped doing it, and I don't know why. I, I, hopefully, I'm going to get back on it. And again, it's things like this. It's like that TED talk where that guy's like, "You got to be reminded every day, well, even if it's like every hour, and you got to rehear this message to change your life." That's what you need to do to keep stay on track. So I'm going to get back on it. Well, I can't remember if they said that. How many times do you need to do something before it becomes like three weeks or something habitual? Like that. Yeah, 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 habitual, so that it days. becomes a consistent thing all the time. And you're so bombarded. You're driving th- by, uh, I, you know, I might ask my kids, hey, what do you guys want for dinner tonight? Let's just go out. Yeah. Well, we talk about that all the time when we're sitting in the sauna is one thing that I think everybody <laughs> should do, everybody in their life should have to do is cut weight. Because if you have to lose over the course of four to six weeks, X amount of body fat, then you have to cut five to 10 pounds. I mean, Native Americans used to do this type of thing in, in little sweat huts. Yep. It changes the way you see everything. If you have to really limit what you eat, and that's when you really realize you know, how much food is blasted into our faces every single day, constantly on ads, on billboards, on TV, on radio. It's just food, 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 and it's all garbage. Most of it's garbage. And you don't really realize that until you cut weight, and it's psychologically, it fucks with you. You know, because you're eating this raw diet and you're, you're hungry. You're really hungry when you're leaning down and trying to get ready for competition Mm -hmm. and you see food everywhere and you realize that it's all of it is trash. That was my break. My brother's biggest thing. He did that. Uh, I did, I did it with him as well. Is that, is it, uh, lemon juice, cayenne and honey. It's a cleanse. Okay. I, to this day, I can't, just the idea of it, I, I could never do it again. But that was the biggest thing he said that he struggled with is he would be watching television and yeah. all of a sudden he realized every single commercial it seemed like was mm-hmm. food based. And it made him just start – it made him, like you said, realize how it just all the time it's bombarded all the time. And we've talked about this in the past, the idea that advertisement companies now have corporations that work solely on their behalf that knows – how to get in our brains to convince us of those things. And once we eat it, 
It's made up of the exact perfect measurements of sugar, salt, and fat that you're addicted to it. So as soon as you're, like you said, done eating it, you're already thinking about the next bite you can get in before yeah. you're done chewing the one that you have in your mouth. So it's almost like the game is rigged. You it know? really is because if I'm watching a commercial, if I'm hungry and I'm watching a commercial on TV or multiple commercials on TV of high-quality food, I want to eat that food probably too. But that's not what we see. We see shit. And when – if you want to dive deep into it and get a little bit uh, conspiracy theorist, go for it. Do it. I'm, Do it. I'm going to. We're jumping <laughs> off the cliff now. Um, it could. It. You know what, what we can trace this really back to is the dollar. We can trace everything back to the dollar and to somebody trying to make money or, or capitalize. The reason that this food is put onto the market is because it's super, super cheap to produce. Um, it has almost no nutritional content whatsoever. It, it makes me think: a somebody's trying to capitalize off of malnutrition, which is bad enough anyway. But then when you start thinking about the education in this country and what we're starting to feed our kids from a very early age, which is a lot of times this trash, is a lot of economically disparaged homes going, hey, the dollar menu is the easiest way I have to feed sure, my kids. absolutely. Well, now we're, now we're bleeding. You know, I was talking about how mentally clear I was when I was eating raw and eating clean. But when we get into a situation where we're feeding our kids trash, that of course is affecting their minds. It's unnatural things being put into their bodies at an age where their minds are developing. We might have generations, you know, in the future of kids who aren't wired correctly. They're not developed correctly mentally because of all of the garbage that they're getting environmentally or from a dietary standpoint. And that is truly an acceleration on the dumbing down of, of our country and our kids. Absolutely. And I actually did my master's degree on the effects of nutrition and behavior in school children. It showed no effects whatsoever, to be honest, but it was only a uh, two-month study, which, I mean, if, if you've been raised on shit and then you get somebody making you something for a couple of weeks, uh, we saw the biggest benefit come from somebody caring Influence, enough to, yeah, to yeah. give them something, but no no other data that showed that the actual nutrition is going to help out with behavior and classroom attendance kind of, or yeah. attention kind of issues. And I'd love to see a, a study on, you know, Really, really, a group of children that had really, really healthy diets in the in the same syllabus, and like from day juice. one, yeah, from day yeah. one, um, for for you know maybe a five or to ten year study to watch the development of the child throughout, and I'm sure you'd see some difference, but I think I would agree that far and away influence is the key thing there with a child's development and interaction because we're our our bodies are designed to to survive on what they can. Right. But we're really developing more based on the, the experiences and the environment that we're put into. But I think that we have a better chance of assimilating information and retaining information and learning information. If our minds are very, very acute and clear. And when I'm eating cheeseburgers compared to when I'm drinking smoothies, sure. there's no comparison oh, whatsoever. Sure. So it, in a fundamental level, the dietary intake that we have is very dramatically impacting our evolution. And when you start t looking into GMO research, like valid GMO research, not FDA funded GMO research, what you find is there, it could be very physically affecting our evolution as well, you know, from, uh, from a, the standpoint of putting this genetically modified material into our own bodies. Right. And it's funny because I have a, a really good friend of mine who I, I brew beer with, brew poison with. He, uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's a he's a big. I think I think he kind of falls along the lines of uh, the the government. You know, colleges are all kind of working for the our, our our overall good is his point of view. And when I talk about GMOs and things like that, he is one of those guys, and he's a world renowned microbiologist. He you know he's one of those. It's like oh, your body's just breaking it down and using it for fuel. That's all it's doing. It has no effect on you. It doesn't matter what it's made up of, and. Part of me, as much as I love him, part of me feels almost like he is being blind to the idea of, wait a second, if what that is made up of isn't of quality or it's been genetically altered, it, it's got to have an effect on your body. Like you said, I mean, it's yeah. got to have qualified That's kind of research ridiculous. about it. Yeah. I, any of the GMO research that I've looked at that was unbiased, you know, there's a ton of biased GMO research out there. Monsanto and, you know, some of the people that advocate the use of this stuff. They've spent a lot of money on it and they're making a lot of money on it. And they're not going to want to admit that if there's small changes to the stomach lining of humans that consume this food, they're going to want to tell you that even though this pesticide that they produce explodes the guts of insects that eat it, that it's perfectly fine for our, our meat and ourselves to consume, you know, because it's not, the levels aren't high enough. Right. 
I'm sorry. I just don't buy that. I'd rather eat celery and carrots. You know what I mean? Sure. I don't want, I don't want somebody to spray some shit on my food. Interesting segue that has created agent orange and other substances that have been used for horrible nefarious reasons. Um, I was just talking, I was actually talking to Rocky on the way over here. I went to Hy-Vee today and I was thinking about what, what am I going to talk about on this podcast? Am I going to bring any interesting experience or are they just going to yammer on about MMA all day? <laughs> and, uh, I tried to be a little more diverse. No, yeah. I, I, that's why I came. I really appreciate it. Um, but no, I, I ran into a Vietnam vet and he was sitting in the, the cafe by himself. He had finished eating and he heard me over talking to uh, Peyton, my daughter, about my dad's old Mustang. We struck up a conversation, or struck up a conversation. I ended up sitting there in his booth while the kids ran around and you know were nuts, and talked to this guy for an hour. And I could tell he was a Vietnam vet. He had his, you know, he had a vest on, all of his pins, medals, hat, all the whole nine yards. And I'd later find out that he actually worked with my dad for quite a while at Cedar Rapids Inc. I got to hear his whole experience, and he's now wa- awaiting a heart transplant um, because of exposure to Agent Orange in the Vietnam War, and. You know, this uh, company, Monsanto, that's got its fingers so deeply into the political scene in Washington, D.C., they've produced some of the most horrible shit known to man. And now they're in charge of the major agricultural operations in the country. They were the ones that created Agent Orange? Yeah, and uh, uh, a couple other really nasty military compounds um, that that were used in the Vietnam War and other other conflicts. But they they make Roundup herbicide. They've been making that for years and years and years. But I, I watched a I watched a documentary called Genetic Roulette that has some of the you know the world's leading advocates against GMO usage, and some of the research that people are completely unaware of is terrifying. And they're and they're immune from litigation thanks to that Monsanto Protection Act. Right. When that when 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 Obama signed that bill and Antichrist. three weeks and three weeks later Antichrist. Sucks. And three weeks later <laughs> Antichrist. they uh that wheat, that genetically altered wheat was hit hit Europe and hit the yeah. western United States. I was like I mean, <laughs> you hate to be a conspiracy a conspiracist kind of person or be too cynical at times, but you saw I, it was just flabbergasting to me. It's like, wait a second, he we, they just signed that bill, and the next week it comes out that this has changed. I mean, well, it's just it was so it was so connected. Yeah. yeah, this this came as no surprise. My dad was a staunch Obama advocate, as was my mom. Probably the biggest Obama supporter I've ever yeah. come in contact with. And and, and and flat out from a partisan perspective, in my opinion, fairly blind. You know, blind to logic and reality. Just. Very, very partisan. Very, very, this is the way, and that's just the way it is. And he supported Obama, even though I brought to the table multiple, multiple points, uh, you know, against Obama. And uh, that was the one that changed everything. He goes, did you, well, did you hear about this Monsanto Protection Act? I said, of course I did. <laughs> of course I did. And I said, well, you know, Dad, he's going to sign that bill. All right. You know, he's like, well, you don't think he's going to sign that bill. I'm like, Dad, he put the former head of Monsanto in charge of the FDA. You know what I mean? This is a guy who said that he'd never used lobbyists in his cabinet. Exactly. He's Transparency. Taking, he's taking one of the most evil corporate empires in the world, you know, a company who's not a lot of people know is tied that owns Blackwater and other paramilitary firms. And you know, he put he put him in charge of the FDA. Of course he's gonna sign it. Comes across his bill all my all of a sudden my dad hates Obama. Like dad, why we had plenty of reasons to hate Obama before Monsanto, <laughs> but this is no real surprise. Sure. You know what I mean? You go to the White House uh, cafeteria, and guess what you find? A cafeteria full of organic food. It's not allowed. GMOs aren't allowed in White House or Senate cafeterias. Do people really think that that's a coincidence? You know what I mean? Oh, we just want the best because they're the best. Well, it's the same thing as Obamacare. Like, oh, it's we're going to push it on all you guys. If you don't buy from the government exchanges, we're going to fine you. But we don't want it. We're not going to make our us as congressmen and senators and presidents and governors. You know, we're not going to make ourselves buy it, of course. Right. And, well, they get free health care. Why would they want to well, pay they, for anything? They get good pensions and they also are allowed to do insider training where I can where I I was a registered representative for a local uh, firm here in town. And if, if I do insider trading, I go to federal prison. If a senator does it, it's. You know, Tuesday. We've talked about this. <laughs> it's Tuesday. We've, we've yeah. talked about this in the podcast quite a few times. If I am in the commission 
on banking. I can walk out after a decision, make a phone call and, and make a shitload of money. And it's absolutely legal. Yep. And then they went in and tried to do it And Nancy Pelosi, who I, I, I don't know her, but I have friends who know her very well, very wealthy people in California who give her to her campaign all the time. And, and she was one who said that she was against it because they had found out the week before Visa had put something through and she was a major stockholder in Visa because she knew it was going to go through. So yeah. she was not going to go against them. It's royalty. You know, people want to, people want to look at Washington DC and talk about how we have politicians. We really don't. We have, we have royalty, you know, we have people that at the end of the day, they're subject to a different law and a different code of, of ethics and rules. And if, if a politician gets involved in a scandal, Oh, well, it's, it's a big news story because it's entertainment for people. But they really are held to a different standard. You know, we have politicians who can get away with things and not only get away with things, just it, it's perfectly legal where Be it's not for us. for it sometimes. Yeah, that's a class difference. That's that's a, an elite it's ruling It's class royalty. warfare. Yeah, it's a royalty class owning a, a middle class. Hey, this is Matt. This is Todd. We are going to cut this podcast short. You mean – you're going to think we, it's short. We, well, we, don't want, short. we don't want to force you to listen to three and a half hours of a podcast. But This, this conversation uh, was three and a half hours long recorded. We're going to stop it here so that you can download it, <laughs> digest it, take a break, take a breath. This is 7A. Podcast 7B is next. And it'll still be with Keone Coke and Rock. And we thought it was... A great conversation and extremely important for the conversation that we want to keep on pushing out there with the primal scream. So we're going to break it up for you. Keep on listening if you want to to the next podcast. But we we, we thought it was a fantastic conversation. We really enjoyed it ourselves. There's, there's a lot more to this podcast than than what you think. Again, this we're only we're only an hour and forty seven minutes into this. What you're listening to right now, there is another two hours <laughs> almost episode seven B. So really i really want you to listen to it it's awesome todd how can people stay attached to us the best way to stay attached to us is to make sure you subscribe go to itunes and go to the podcast section of itunes and type in the primal scream be a big gorilla Stern, be, be, be stern, a big fucking gorilla <laughs> staring you in the face <laughs> and uh that'll be us subscribe to us um we have the primal org is our website on there. You can actually get to iTunes. It's probably a little bit faster that way. Get on Facebook, like us. The more likes we get, the better we feel about ourselves. Love it. The big mystery. Wakana Tonka, whatever you want to call it. You know, we're, we're, we're out there. So make sure you follow us. We just, I mean, we're just having the best time right now doing this podcast. We've had a lot of downloads recently that gets us really jazzed and excited. And we really, really appreciate everybody out there downloading us. But we do want to hear from you because we really appreciate all the attention we're getting and all the accolades we've we've heard from people. And so we want you to, to let us know about stuff. And we'll work shit in the podcast. If you have a comment. A you topic. Like, a topic. You thought we were fucking full of shit on something. Let us know. Yeah, and we we'll would love to talk about it. And hash it out because you know what? I have no fucking clue on half the shit we talk about sometimes. <laughs> and I really need for shit to be explained to me. Hey, so we're okay with that. The majority of what we talk about is opinion based. And uh, I, I, the reason why I do this podcast is, is as a therapeutic thing to get out my emotions, get out my feelings, uh, verbalize what I've been taking in for the whole week. Yeah. And uh, I want to learn. So I want to meet interesting people like Keone. I want to talk and discuss and get other people's points of views and i want to possibly change my point of view so if you have something that is contrary to what i'm saying i really do want to hear it i yeah. do really do want to hear it because i would i'd much rather be more well informed than just some idiot spouting stupid shit absolutely and i and, and let me tell you from my point of view as a lib a die in the wool liberal progressive individual my ideas of uh, gun ownership and the Second Amendment and the military and the way government functions in this country has been dramatically changed by just the podcast and conversations that I've had with people in the last two or three months. It's it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Now I when you open I, yourself up to those conversations, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty much the same guy, but my perspectives have shifted in small amounts that I think has allowed me to grow. And I really hope that the podcast in and of itself helps people out and has some some of the same 
shifts in ideas, not because I'm telling you to or that what I have to say has any kind of importance at all, but the ideas that we put forward on the on the podcast can have that effect sometimes. So, Hey, if nothing else, it's going to remind you or uh, create an icebreaker for you at the water fountain at work the next day. Hey, do you listen to these two dumbasses? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever it is. I really hope that you guys find this, one, entertaining and maybe two, thought-provoking. So thank you very much for following us, for listening to us, and uh, have a good night. I'm Matt. I'm Todd. See you later. Adios. Good night. And maybe two thought of So thank you very much for following us, for listening to us. And uh, I'm Matt. I'm Todd. See you later. Adios. Good night. <laughs>